Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me loud and clear? I know it's uh, only a very few people here, but we need to use the mic because there's a lot of people listening online, and they can hear us only if you use the mic. Okay. My name is Varun Malik. Uh, I'm the CEO of Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is a new age consulting firm. Uh, we like to say powered by a digital platform. Um, we work with clients across uh, the GCC. We have about 70 or 80 clients. Fairly new firm, spent about six years in the region so far. Um, very different model from traditional consulting firms. Uh, some of our clients are here today, so they'll attest to that as well. Um, we like to host events like these, uh, where we call, we have one community of HR professionals, we have a community of marketing professionals, sales and marketing professionals. We're setting up one community of finance professionals, and this community is set up for procurement professionals, so everyone around the table here. Um, these events are a very, a very, very different format, right? So these are not, this is not a conference, as you can see, so uh, we don't like to do very large events. We do attend them from time to time, but I personally feel quite uneasy at very large conferences, which is why what we do is very small events, normally 25, 30 people attending. Uh, they're all from one function. And what we do is you participate with us, okay? Uh, we're going to do a talk today, uh, which is going to be welcome. If you can sit on the front tables, if that's all right. It will help us. Yeah. Um, so, like I was saying, we follow a very, very different format. The idea here is to make each other better. So this isn't one of those events where we're going to come and do four, five talks, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, and we're just going to try and impart knowledge, right? This community is about learning from each other, making each other better. And how do we do that? One, you gain knowledge from others. So John Joe and Sam and Anthony today from Capita Procurement are here to share their knowledge with us. Uh, they've flown down from the UK first to Saudi to share their knowledge with Saudi and they're here with us in Dubai. Um, so many, many of these events, we share knowledge uh, from others. But the other very good source of knowledge is all of you, right? And you see seven chairs there. Those are for you. For those of you who want to come on stage and speak with us and share your knowledge. So that's going to be the second. We're going to have some roundtable discussions um, between all of you, which you will learn from each other. These events are also about building your personal brand. Okay. So what you do is when you're on the stage, when you're sharing your knowledge with people here, with the 50, 60 odd people watching online, you're building your personal brand as well. So it's not just about knowledge, it's not just about learning, it's not just about networking, but also about building your individual personal brands. Um, we share a lot of opportunities in this community. I don't know how many of you are part of the Consolidon Professionals community. It's a WhatsApp community where you get a lot of messages, opportunities. I see Zoran, Artem. Uh, Natalia is a part of it, Amar, Manoj, et cetera. Uh, Mahesh is a part of it as well, right? Um, why have we created this community? We have roughly around, and we've started setting up this procurement community about two months back now. Hitain, who's sitting outside still, but I'm sure he'll come in soon, uh, runs this community for us, and uh, we have a, roughly around 150 procurement professionals in this community. Um, we share several opportunities on this community. These are job opportunities for you. These are short-term consulting opportunities, long-term consulting opportunities for those of you whose employers allow you to take those on, right? Uh, and we feel that increasingly there's a lot of procurement professionals joining the gig economy with us. Many of them work with us on our projects to our clients as well. Uh, so any of you who are available for that, those opportunities are great for you. They're great for your friends who might be looking for a job currently or 
might be uh, you know between jobs. Okay. Um, of course, networking in any event, you can spend, uh, we do try and keep consciously some breaks in between so that you can network with each other. Are there any tables where there are two people from the same organization sitting on the table? Well, yeah, very soon, I think three of you need to move out to three tables. Yes, one of you will need to move out to another table, right? You can do it now, you can do it later. Um, What's the agenda for today? Uh, today, I uh, meant to say today is the formation session of this procurement community. So when we, for example, set up, set up our HR community or our marketing and sales community about a year back, we started off with a formation event. The formation event is where all of you together discuss what you would like to do in these events. These are quarterly events, so we're gonna do them every quarter, so one of, one of Today's uh, discussion points is going to be, what do we want to learn during these events? What do we want to share during these events? How often should we have these events? Should we have these events on Monday or not, right? Should we have these events on Friday? Friday mornings, Friday evenings, right? If that makes sense. Um, and we'll cover that off in the last part of today's discussion. So the agenda, uh, John Joe is going to talk about, and he'll do an introduction for himself, uh, he will talk about bridging the gap from uh, vision to reality, uh, of course, in the con context of procurement. So he's going to talk about the future of procurement uh, or the future procurement department and how uh, you, know, you can bridge the gap from that vision to today's reality. Okay? Uh, John Joe is then going to, uh, or I'm going to call six of you up to the uh, stage. Uh, Ideally, we like to have one person from a table, but of course, uh, today is the formation meeting, so feel free to volunteer. Uh, John Joe, at the end of his talk, will uh, speak briefly about what we're going to cover in this discussion, so that you know you uh, come up if you have thoughts to share and value to add on that topic. Of course, okay. We're going to have another uh, roundtable discussion, the talent challenge, and this is why I'm saying this is a very, very different format from what you're used to uh, attending. Most of you, when you attend events, I'm sure there's a lot of speakers or there's panelists who come in and talk, but they've been pre-selected. We don't work like that. This is more of a round table discussion. This is your community, right? So feel free to share. Um, Sam is going to talk, uh, is going to moderate a round table discussion uh, called the Talent Challenge. It's gonna uh, be about uh, finding talent within uh, procurement. Right, uh, and I'm sure all of us face that challenge from time to time in the UAE. And then we're going to talk, Diego, who's not here yet, but is the uh, chief wellness officer at FAB, uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank, is going to co uh, come and talk about leveraging wellness uh, to create a high performance culture, of course, for procurement leaders, okay? So the first three talks, are, or the first talk in the next two discussions are going to be related to procurement. The last one is a little bit not technical procurement as a discussion, but still very important for everyone around this table, as I'm sure you would agree. Um, we, he spoke with our HR leaders uh, in the HR meeting two weeks back, and I asked him, can you come and speak with our procurement leaders as well? So hopefully you'll enjoy these uh, talks and these discussions. Um, so that's about it uh, from me. Uh, any questions before we start? Any comments uh, before we go on? And you will get a chance after John Joe's talk to do quick introductions so that everyone here gets to know each other as well. Um, one thing to remember is this community meets every quarter, which means you'll see a lot of these people every quarter from now on. So it's good to get to know each other as well. Okay. Perfect. So over to you, John Joe. Yeah, we're there. All right, so I'm just going to go on stage because I think the camera is going to need the height, otherwise you don't get the slides. So I'm going to put that for us. So just wait for the presentation to come up. Thank you. You just want to go click on the first slide for me? Right, so 
that's, that's me. I'm John Joe. I've been with Capita for uh, nearly 12 years now. Um, I run Capita's procurement consulting practice, which is the practice that focuses on external clients. So it's not the internal procurement function. Um, I've got 25 years in procurement, so I've lived in Paris doing procurement with American Express. I've lived in Germany doing procurement with Universal Music. Um, moved back to the UK, and we work with a, a vast range of clients um, across all sectors, which I'll talk about in a second. But I think, first of all, there's probably a question, who is Capita? Because it might not be a name that's particularly well known here. Capita has around 50,000 employees um, working all around the world. There are vast offices in South Africa, India, in Europe, Germany, Bulgaria, Poland, and, and many other places around the world. It is one of the largest providers of services to the UK government. Um, at one stage, the nickname was Government in a Box because there pretty much wasn't anything that they weren't able to do as far as the government services were required. However, it has two divisions, and there is a second division called Capita Experience, which very much focuses on private sector clients as well. So we are not focused purely on the public sector. Um, within all of those 50,000 employees sits Capita Procurement Solutions, which is the where Anthony, Sam, and I are from. And we are a very traditional procurement consulting practice. I could sit here and I could say things like, we're different because we do this, that, and the other. But the reality is, much of what procurement consulting firms do is pretty common. Um, I think there was going to be some changes rapidly coming with AI, chat, GPT, and everything else, as, as we can briefly touch on during this, and I'm sure will come up in conversation today. But we are a pretty traditional procurement consulting business. From a client perspective, we operate across both sectors too, so we are what's known as sector agnostic. Um, we work significantly with places like defense, health, transport, on the regulated or semi-public or even the fully public sector side. And then on the private sector side, uh, retail, manufacturing, financial services tend to be the dominant categories, although we have worked with pharmaceutical companies and others before. If you'd like to pop on one slide. So I think everything good begins with a story. Um, so we're today going to talk about the challenge of the evolution of procurement. And I think, you know, once upon a time, there were 50 procurement people sitting in a room trying to figure out how to get from where they were today to the future of procurement, the transformation journey, the evolution of procurement. And I don't think there's ever been a more difficult time to figure out what that future looks like. The most exciting time, but also quite a difficult time. And as far as transformation is concerned, a vast number of transformation programs fail. Um, and that's for a multitude of reasons. This isn't just that there is a dearth of transformation skills. Change is difficult. And change is difficult for a very, very, very many reasons, as you can see from the second quote. So what we're going to talk about today is how you bridge the gap from where you are today to where you might want to get to in the future. This is a personal journey, okay? You cannot go to a single place to get an in-the-box solution for transformation, okay? Our experience across 35 different clients, some within the same sector, so you, know, you would imagine, oh, they're in the same sector, they're both pharmaceutical companies, very different journey. So you have a different environment and a different culture and different hurdles to overcome. Don't forget that. Personalize that journey. Make sure you take account of all the things that make your business the unique business or the unique working environment that it is. And lastly, invest in the program properly. This isn't just about money. It's about commitment. It's about a commitment from your team. It's a commitment from the wider business. It's finance. It's IT. Um, it's procurement. It's the internal stakeholders. It's the internal customers. It's your suppliers. Unless you get those investments correct, you're setting off and making the journey infinitely harder than it needs to be. So, 
all of those things considered, I think there are common challenges that you're going to come across. I hope not all of them, because that will be a very challenging transformation. But certainly, I think you will see elements of these within any transformation program. So lack of organizational buy-in. So you go and you talk to your boss and you say, you know what, I really want to do a procurement transformation because you know what, we're going to use some generative AI in the future and I want to get my processes solved. And he goes, yeah, brilliant, go do it. And he thinks that's his role. It's done, I'm finished, I don't have to say anything else. No, that's not organizational buy-in. Organizational buy-in is creating a governance structure. It's creating a project communi community. It's having a communications plan. It's sharing that journey with everybody so that you don't end up in a change-resistant culture because you've shared the thing that you're going to be doing together. Change-resistant cultures are probably one of the most challenging things to overcome. Nobody really likes change being done to them, but if you get them through organizational buy-in along with you, they feel they're driving the change. And that is an absolutely vital component of transformation. Ineffective change communication. Uh, we, we learned very quickly in our transformation journeys the importance of comms. Um, and we now have a comms team. And it's, it's headed by an, a, a wonderful lady whose sole focus within a transformation program is to make sure we talk to everybody involved in that program on a regular basis. Governance cycles have established comms patterns, um, timings, the, everything, every component of that. And that has been one of the most successful things that en enabled us to make sure everybody's in the program with you. A lack of capacity to support. Uh, I said it at the beginning, I'll say it again. Make sure people have got the time to fulfill their role within your program. If they don't have the time, your program will struggle. Um, undefined goals. Undefined goals is slightly trickier at the moment. I think you know, we, the, the, the world of technology is going to create some amazingly new environments for us, which I think are very, very exciting. But I think creating a, an idea of exactly what's going to be happening with generative AI and procurement five years from now is pretty difficult at the moment. That said, create a program and remain agile within the direction that you're taking, and your transformation program has a far higher chance of succeeding. Senior sponsorship, I've spoken about that briefly at the top, but make sure you've got right from the top. If you have it from the top, it will have a dramatically increased chance of success. And budget constraints. Um, some of the conversations we've had in the last few weeks, so we've come from uh, London SIPs three weeks ago, Barcelona, we were there for four days, two weeks ago, last week we were in Riyadh for three days, and we're here today. A consistent, a consi all of these things are consistent conversations with, with everybody. It doesn't matter where you are. I think budget constraints are slightly different in Riyadh and possibly here than they are in England. Um, we get a lot more challenge around what's this going to cost than some of the extraordinary conversations we've had in this part of the world. Um, do you guys remember the Rubik's Cube? Everyone remembers this. The, I never ever finished one. But I think what we're trying to say here is you have people processing technology. You know, th these are the sort of cornerstones, traditional cornerstones that everybody will talk about. And in some cases, you will finish one before you finish the others. Completing all three is very, very difficult. Okay, we know that. And I think the challenge is to turn the pieces of a transformation program in a considered way that enables the ultimate journey to be achieved. I've seen, we have all seen, programs where technology has raced ahead. And often technology will think that they have designed the ultimate environment because it might be designed by your IT team. Has the IT team considered the user, the people? Because if you've got an IT designed tech stack and you haven't factored in the user, you're probably going to have significant problems. Um, the user is the most important person. Because if you give them something, that, a car that they can't drive, you're not going to go anywhere. Always think of the people who are operational. Those are the people who are going to enable the outcomes that you are seeking to achieve to be realized. Process and policy. Um, again, people tend to, 
tend to look at a process and say, we're not going to change how we do this. Let's change the system. Let's have a bespoke module around whatever it may be. Not necessarily the road to take. Yes, you're going to have to think about that within the context of your business, your practice. But those are all considerations that need to be thought about. And lastly, the obvious piece within all of this is technology alone is not enough. Okay, so if you want to go to the next slide, I think, you know, there is this, this conversation that's going on everywhere at the moment. It's, is there a magic bullet to all of my problems? Is generative AI going to, I can go and buy some generative AI from whoever it may be, drop it over the top of everything that I do, and everything's going to be amazing? I don't think that's the answer. And it's certainly not going to be the answer for a few years. Um, someone described it to me when we were in Barcelona. They said, if you go to the doctors and you've got to have a blood test, and they say, go into that room and there's a machine in there that's going to do the blood test. He said, I'm not sure about that. I know it can do it. But when I look to the left, I want to see a nurse or a doctor. I don't want the system to be everything. Does it have the emotional quotient? Does it have the considerative processes that are human to ensure that the right things are done. I do think that this represents the most incredible opportunity for procurement to deliver more value into the environments that you work in on an individual level. If you think of work and you go, when I get into the office every day, there is this chunk of stuff which I hate. There is this transactional handle that I have to turn. Technology is likely to take away a vast amount of that. The exciting thing is that technology will enable you to have more insights and more time to service the internal client. That's our opportunity. You know, I can sound over-enthusiastic about what that means for our industry, but what I think, and what I firmly believe is going to happen is that we have a chance to provide insight, intelligence, support, capacity, because of the foundations that technology will be putting in place for us. Use that correctly and we're going to become an even more important component in all of the things that you currently do. Being the problem solvers that procurement regularly is, is a demanding task. It's risk, go to procurement. It's ESG, someone go and ask procurement. It's a tender, someone go and ask procurement. It's a contract, go and ask procurement. All of those things are multifaceted drain. I don't think there's any other part of a business that gets called upon for so many different things. This is going to enable us to, to actually service those. I'm not going to, Sam's going to talk about the talent gap later on. And I think the combination of the challenge with talent and technology means that the future is looking very bright for us. Um, so where do you start with technology? And I'm not going to sell you a system. I'm not going to sit here and talk about SAP, Cooper, Evaluer, and the absolute specifics of which ones of those you should be using. Um, I don't know your companies. It would be wrong of me to do that. But do take time to understand what the market can offer. And define what you need, not what you want. So many times we go into companies, and you're looking at what they have, and they're not using half of it. They don't understand the modules they've got. They start talking to you, I need to do this about risk. You go, well, you've got that. Oh, okay, so make sure you understand what you have, what you need, and what the market can offer you. I mentioned it earlier, the user-focused approach. Successful IT uh, work streams within transformation programs have the user community heavily factored within it. It's that simple. So make sure you get a proper representation of the various departments that you need Subject to the modules that you're going to be taking, is it finance, is it procurement ops, is it HR? Get them involved. Cost be benefits. Um, you know, it can be incredibly expensive to implement any one of those systems that I might have mentioned before. Do you want to go down that road right now? Is your maturity at a point where the leap from today to a fully implemented all singing, all, all dancing, SAP, SAP Ariba, whatever it may be, is that the journey you're ready for? Maybe you need an interim solution. Have those considerations. And the last two are kind of together. Recognize the scale of change that we're about to see and the speed with which it's coming. And whatever program you're on, make sure you've got the agility 
to make those changes and make your, your world as future-proofed as it can be. And some of that might just be simply making sure the processes you have are robust. It might not mean that the solution doesn't get tinkered with. Because I'm absolutely sure that generative AI is going to change certain things that you think are perfect now. Um, people, the most important component and will remain the most important component. Um, like I said, Sam is going to talk about people, so I'm not going to steal his thunder around this, but consider the changes that you're making and what it means to those people. There's a lot of fear mongery, in particular in probably, I'm not sure out here to be honest, we, we, I'd, I'd have to really think about it, but certainly within Europe, there's a lot of fear that AI is going to literally steal your job. Talk to people about what it means. Prepare a development plan for what it means. If you know that you've got a process driven by tech that's going to free their time, have the conversation with them about what they like to do. Okay, what are we going to do with that 30%, those day and a half, two days a week? What would you like to get involved with? Take them on that journey, see what value they identify as wanting to be involved with or that you need for them to take on as an extra responsibility. Collaboration, understanding your stakeholders. Um, I, you know, multiple departments have different demands upon procurement, and I think if we were to, you know, you have finance, you have HR, but then you think from a buying perspective, the difference between logistics and marketing. Um, make sure your stakeholders within those departments are engaged with uh, and embraced. Automation will involve job descriptions. I was speaking to somebody the other day who said, in the future, when you apply for a job, you might be applying against an AI-driven computer. I was a bit stunned at first. And then the logic was, if I'm going to go and ask for this job in the marketplace, maybe I should be asking my computer or my tech stack, can you do this? And therefore, you are almost considering in the future, are we going to be seeing people applying against the computer? What I think that means is the conversation that I've already started is, it will evolve job descriptions because people can deliver more, bring more value, more insight. And I think that's really exciting, but we've got to take our teams with us. Um, it's the motivation and consider career ladders. That is linked to here. When we know where the job descriptions are going for the teams that you've got within the processes and environments you currently work within, and you think you know where you're going, you need to take the people on that journey with you. Better distribution of talent and use of capability, I think that's linked to this as well. It's as you free up capacity by through efficiency, as people find that they're really enjoy the new aspects of how procurement's going to function, make sure you spread that correctly. And team structure, consider different approaches. It's traditional in a transformation in any case. If you do a transformation well, it's likely you're going to be driving significant efficiency. Certainly, we tend to find anywhere from 15 to 30% from a staff perspective of capacity created. Um, when you're doing that, you've got to look at your service models for the future, and that is a very people-heavy part of the process. Um, process? Um, yes, I mean, there's, there's no end of conversation that can be had around process design. Um, processes obviously drive efficiency, it goes without saying. Uh, I think a lot of people tend to think that um, the process and technology relationship is, is, is often well managed, and it's actually often not. So if you want to enable efficiency by the use of efficient processes within technology, they've got to be designed in companion with each other. You don't have a process defined without looking at how the current technology or the new technology stack that you're looking for runs a similar process. Um, they obviously drive consistency and standardization when done well. There will always be processes that operate around the edge, of course, goes without saying. But try to create processes that work with your tech stack. You will get consistency in standardization. You will drive efficiency of your people because they will understand what they're going to find when they're operating within the system. Um, a huge topic for the moment, uh, monitoring and controlling risk, of course. Um, you know, you, Suez Canal, geopolitics, ESG, it's, it's all incredibly demanding on procurement people. Um, like I said earlier, there are so many facets to the problems you are asked to solve. 
but a standard process is one of the ways to eliminate elements of risk. Know your process, know the boundaries of the process, and risk gets reduced. Um, processes allow measurement and comparison. You know, why is one department able to operate with the process flows that you've put in place in an efficient and effective way, and another one not? Why does marketing keep resisting that beautiful process you've put in place when your logistics team are very happy with it? Um, but you can understand, because you've created a process, what the divergent parts are. Consider the impact of changes on stakeholders. Um, again, that's the engagement piece. It's governance, it's communication. Um, and it's best practice, which everyone loves to talk about, but frequently we don't quite get to. So, the conclusion, I guess, of all of this. Um, the point of this is to share experiences. The point of this is to, I hope, in any change journey that you've got going on in the coming months, and these slides will be available for everyone to take away, it's to not find yourself thinking, oh my word, I'm in this unique situation myself, I don't know how to move forward. There is a commonality of challenge that you will face. Um, it's not a quick journey. Um, it, it, um, I, I would love to say it is, but it's really not. Um, take your time to make the right decisions. Um, the obvious one, a procurement transformation is not just about procurement because it's going to make everyone's lives better if you execute it well. Part of that is making sure they know what you're doing before you do it to them and you're actually doing it with them. Be realistic about what you can achieve. Um, if you set off on a transformation journey and boundaries are imposed upon you, make sure people understand redefined outcomes, um, but also cost. Transformation journeys that have open budgets tend to use their budgets. So be very careful about the budgeting perspective. So I guess the end of the story, you know, the story said once upon a time there were 50 people sitting in a room trying to sort of discuss the future of um, their procurement function. I don't think there's really an end to that story. Um, I certainly couldn't write it today. Maybe I should have asked ChatGPT to write it and they would have come up with something better. But I think the point I'm trying to make is the only constant that we've got at the moment is change. Um, every single time you think the tech, you know, the saturated world of technology solutions providers in procurement has given you the ideas that you need, something else emerges. When we were in Barcelona, there were about 30, 35 sponsors. And I recognized about five of them. Last year, I knew at least half of them, personally. I knew their tech systems, I knew their stacks. This time, it had dramatically changed. So, change is constant. So, once upon a time, I'm afraid the story doesn't end. Change is constant, expect it, but embrace it because I think it's going to create the ability for procurement to be a much more effective, insightful, valuable business partner for all of the broader businesses that you work in. Thank you. So I, we have time for questions, don't we? So I, I do have time for questions if, if anybody has any. Or I'm sure we will poke at a few things when we're having a, um, a panel discussion. But no questions. Okay. Thank you, John Joe. Any comments as well from anyone based on your experiences? Manoj? Management 
and then they try to run it down. So everything else that follows is generally not the perfect action. So I think, I think that's an important piece of information that sometimes gets missed out because what the reality is, is not what the management at the top thinks. Yeah, uh, and I 100% agree with you. Uh, I, you know, I think um, when we talk about communication, there's a vast amount that sits in there. It's making sure everybody is involved. Um, data is often a conversation. You know, data is a cornerstone of everything we do. You know, we, everyone will talk about data lakes. They will talk about you know, uh, data-driven decision-making. Um, and that's absolutely correct. There's no, there's no question around that. I think you have to create the right communities at the front. If you don't, you end up in that situation. Um, all, all I can say is that was one of the things that we created a communications function and recruited people specifically for uh, program communications with, and it's not just a once a month, there are weekly sessions to communicate the progress of transformation, was to ensure that everybody was involved. You know, because without that, you're absolutely right. You have a board who think X is happening in X time scale, and you have the user, like I said, the most important person, saying, well, that ambition is never going to meet my reality. But, um, but yes, I, I take that on board. Absolutely. Data, shared experience, shared outcomes, absolutely key to it. But baselining is, is so difficult. Data baselining is incredibly hard. Um, so the, the point there was making, um, do you all understand where you're starting from? And that's not just data, that's process as well. The problem with data at the moment is there is so much. So the same business now has access to probably three or four times the data that was available two or three years ago. And what you do with it. Um, we see what we nicknamed, it's not a great term, uh, data paralysis, where there is a vast investment in trying to be 100% accurate about the data profile of your business before you make a step forward. Um, I'm not saying rush, I'm definitely not saying rush, but I am saying don't get paralyzed because you don't have to solve every component of the data problem in order to target specific things to make progress with. Agree okay. on that. Any other comments? Anyone else? Well, you have to make comments very soon because <laughs> like I said, we'll invite six of you to come and join us on stage. Uh, so we normally do one per table, but there you go, the gentleman in the gray. Oh, you have a comment rather than joining us on the stage? Okay, question, okay. perfect. But, but after, just think about who would like to come up on the stage. Remember this is, yeah, this is not about, uh, this is a very different type of uh, event, different type of session. We want to uh, encourage participation from the audience as well. Yes? How can we like uh, automation, like AI and automation can process uh, impact in the future? How can we enable it to do it? Um, it's a, <laughs> one, it's definitely going to happen. That's the first comment. So it's in, 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 enabling AI. I, I think there's an interesting conversation that we have had uh, with a number of providers of tech that has begun to bolt AI into their systems. Um, so traditional transactional ERP, P2P providers, S2P, whichever version you're using, are beginning to put modules on that have elements of AI within them. I think the first steps that people are talking about are safe space. So they are finding a specific element of their activity that they are comfortable moving to a more system-led decision-making process. That'll be the first comment. So if you want to take a project within your business further, Pick somewhere safe where you can do a POC, proof of concept. Um, then I think the decision-making parameters are changing. I remember many years ago, five, six years ago, having a conversation with the guys from IBM, and they had the Watson-powered end-to-end process piece, and it was very useful for manufacturing companies or anybody, car manufacturers, people like that, because it could do stock monitoring, it could do replenishment. And the experiences that they were talking about was 
At what point did you feel confident enough to back away from a, an approvals point in a process and allow technology to make that decision for you? When I saw the guy recently, it was a similar kind of conversation. It's proof of concept, safe space, and then slowly see, all right, well, can we do finance approvals automatically? At what point do you go, do you know what, just do everything? Or do you say, you know what, I'm gonna hold from a risk perspective, finance's final sign-off, which is a manual sign-off for payment of invoices. So I think that's some of it. Talk to your providers, understand what they're doing. Um, actually, you'll find a lot of the providers want to talk to you because they are interested in your experiences and where you think your, 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 your practices and your processes could be taken to help with them. But those are the typical conversations. I suspect there will be a, um, a plunge moment when there's going to be a dramatic increase in the number of companies who are gonna go, right, let's go all in. Let, let's, let's take a big step now. Do I think that will differ by sector? Yes. Am I an expert enough to tell you exactly what those answers are? Which sectors go first? No. But I suspect um, anything where the stock is probably going to be ahead of, of others. I hope that helps a little bit. Okay. Sorry, one minute. So there's, there's an audience on the live stream. They can't hear you if you don't speak into yeah. the mic, which is why we were yeah. very particular about speaking into the mic. Yeah. So what do you think one transactional function in procurement which will completely disappear? Uh, well, I spent some time the other day looking at contract creation. Okay. There was a provider in Saudi, uh, in Riyadh last week, and I was pretty surprised by just how much of a contract creation process can be automated. Um, I, like I said, though, if I was really to pick something, I think if you're a manufacturing business and you've got stock management, I strongly suspect that will be something that will be at the front of the queue. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible exactly what it can do already. Um, I, wonder, I wonder, actually, there probably are providers who are pretty close to fully automating some of the stock replenishment processes. Um, but yeah, I was, from, from our point of view in the room, um, this provider last week was demonstrating the contract creation process, and it was just a series of, of, of clicks. And I then was looking at it and going, well, actually, if you did a chat GPT 10 sentence, I need this contract for this, I think it could have probably done about 90% of what you needed. Hmm. So it's surprising, because a contract is something related to a lawyer. Yeah. And a lawyer needs to review the contract before it gets... The last 5%, the last 10%. But, you know, so I, I come from a family of lawyers. Um, both of my parents are lawyers. Both of my sisters are lawyers. Um, and the, the thing that I found um, most interesting is in the UK conversations around what AI is going to threaten, lawyers are one of the professions that is, um, should we say, nervous about what it means because they can see already the efficiencies that can be driven. And I would imagine that the cost model of getting a lawyer's advice might change dramatically. Um, even stockbrokers, but we're not here to talk about stockbrokers because we, you know, that's not my area of expertise by a long way. But lawyers are definitely contract creation, contract repository, finding case law, cross-referencing you know, old contracts, new contracts, can all be done. OK, thank you. Yes. Oh, microphone. Yeah. All those 90% of the people that would be impacted by automated contract creation. Yeah. How do you positively, you were speaking about it, involve them into this transformation journey? And what effects would it have on the organizational bottom line? I mean, efficiencies and AI is about creating efficiencies mm -hmm. and organizations are driven by efficiencies. Yep. Of course, they, would, they are looking for creativity, they are looking for new business models, but how much of that 90% is going to be involved into the new business models? I shouldn't have said 90% because someone, I knew someone would quote me. Um, so, 
I can't, you know, I'm going to go for a general commentary around this. In England, you tend to find that within procurement, there's this word that gets overwritten, which is commercial. Okay? Um, certainly had it within central government. We need X number of commercial people to support the business. And when you get under the hood of what that means, in the context of procurement, they're often contract related. It's contract managers, it's uh, contract reletting, it's, it's those sorts of activities. Um, come back to that in a second. Second comment I'd make around, do you have a big in-house legal team or are you using external providers? So from an efficiency and cost perspective, um, if you've got external providers charging um, as they do, substantial hours, and you can execute more of the process in-house, then you have a direct efficiency and cost saving. So that's an obvious, obvious one. I guess if you have in-house legal counsel, there's probably going to be elements where there's going to be a right-sizing of the department. You know, do we actually need all of that? I mentioned it during the presentation. There's an element around uh, redefining job descriptions. So you might be able to, instead of having uh, junior people involved in the business who traditionally have spent 80% of their time writing a contract, and now it only needs to be whatever it may be, they may be able to be involved more in value and insight. So they might be able to be start working on relationships, you know, the contractual side of executing relationships. Um, so that, that's almost like a new contributing element to supporting procurement. And why is that important? Again, I'm not going to steal Sam's, Sam's thunder, but there, is a, there isn't enough talent coming into procurement. We know that. Um, and, and I think anything that can be done throughout the entire involvement in executing procurement processes, be that HR, legal, um, whatever else may be involved, that enables procurement people to have more time to execute with their expertise the broader range of things we get involved with, that will be the efficiency. So that person might end up doing more elements of contract reporting, monthly supplier relationship management meetings, or supporting those sorts of things, and then procurement is, is freed up to do insights. So it's not necessarily isolating it by department. You might have to look across the whole process and say, okay, that is all of the stuff procurement does, and then you can evaluate efficiency. So um, that would be a comment. If you then ask the dystopian question around what does the future look like when computers are doing everything, then it, maybe it's time for H.G. Wells to come and, and finish the presentation because I'm, I, I, I couldn't comment about 10 years from now. But it is extraordinary what it can do already. Any other questions, comments? Yes. It would be nice. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> it would be very nice if you introduce yourself as well before asking the question. So, uh, my na my name is Zubair Sabdar. I uh, head the uh, procurement operations at uh, Solutions Plus, which is a Mubadla company. Okay. Uh, see, we actually all of us uh, we spend a large part of our day you're parsing through emails, and uh, you know you're flooded with emails. So uh, how, how do you see AI as uh, helping us parse through emails, maybe, you know, <laughs> taking some decisions, you know, you know you yeah. focusing them down to the most important ones? I, I'm sure Google and all these, uh, you know, portals are already doing that. But in, in, in the context of procurement, how do you see that happening? Or do you see that uh, coming? Um, that's a really good question. I think there's a cultural element Thank to that. Um, I'd probably split it into two pieces. When you look at the emails you have get, I look at them, the ones that I get, um, there are system-created requirements of me. So it might be um, you need to approve this invoice, you need to approve this recruitment, you need to approve this job description, you need to do X, Y, and Z. That, to me, would be an immediate area where you're going to see benefits as you've got more process efficiency, process control, and intelligent technology behind it, possibly doing more of those roles. So I would expect to see, in the course of time, a reduction in some of those processes. Um, the other one is, it's really interesting you say this, because our operations director is a lady called Jo, and it's her biggest bugbear is the volume of emails that she receives every day. 
So many times she is CC'd on an email and then feels obliged to become involved. And the answer to that is, it's very hard to change a culture which emails have created, which is almost collective responsibility because you get this idea that, well, I CC'd you on that, so you knew about it, so don't leave me as the only person responsible. So the first part's probably easier to explain. The second one is, I'll lend you Joe, and what she does is come inside and emails everyone and says, don't send me that email ever again because it's unhelpful, and I need to be efficient with my time. So if you're sending it to me, and it's to, then you'll get an answer. If it's CC me, Assume I haven't read it, I might have done, but assume I haven't, because I've got lots of emails. And if it's blind copy, I'll read it, and I might have a quiet chat with you later on. So there's process-driven efficiency that will reduce stuff naturally, but the rest of it, we're, we've been where you are. It's the cultural challenge of everyone likes to send an email. It's a bit like the new one with Teams. You know, you're sort of, someone says to you, blah, 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 I'll, I'll stick a Teams in. Just call me. You don't have to put a Teams in and clog my diary anymore. Just pick up the phone or dial me on Teams straight away and let's have a chat and deal with it. Um, so I think there's some cultural bits in there. And definitely since the sort of COVID experience of moving to remote working and everyone using Teams more, I, I think it's, there is a bit more sort of process paralysis of processing things. Not the process is failing, but getting through the daily workload is... Um, can be cumbersome, I agree with you. So a bit of tech, and maybe have a chat with everyone. Yeah. Just building on that query which is asked, I think from a regulatory purpose, having a CC in your email also binds you, so you just cannot ignore it. So that's just a point of view here, is that we have instances when companies have got into trouble because the senior management ha was CC to it, Probably they read it or not read it is a different matter, but it becomes a tacit approval or tacit knowledge, which is also a challenge. So like you said, it's a definitely a cultural issue, but there are implications of where, how the CC, you know, what is the The point of the conversation of isn't that she's saying I'm not responsible. She's saying if it's really important, send it to me, you know, because if I've got 100 emails to go through today, the two are the ones I'm going through first. So if you want to be on the list of two and not the list that's dealt with tomorrow, Send it to me. Just this constant stream. I am going to go to London tomorrow. OK. What do you want me to do about that? You've just told me you're going to London. Just go to London. Um, it's those sorts of content that you end up reading where you're going, you've just taken 30 seconds of my life, and I'm not getting that back. So just keep that to yourself and give me the things that are important. Let me focus on the right things. No, no completely agreed. Yeah. But I'm just saying yeah. that there is, there is the other impact that we need yeah. to be aware that if a Email is in your CC, and if you have missed it, it could also mean yep. there is some important information there. But yeah. Just a point. Yeah. There is a different aspect to all this email challenge. Yeah. Uh, it, with ChatGPT, it also becomes easier to write more emails. They take less time. So. <laughs> yeah, I, t t so far I haven't, unless people are doing that to me and I don't know it, which is, I guess is possible, um, I'd like to think not. I'd like to think I'd spot when Sam's sending me an email and it's not someone else. Um, but I haven't had that experience. So it's, I'll, I'll ponder that one. Uh, maybe I'm going to start noticing there's lots of emails there that are clearly written by someone you know, that is, is a technology and not human. Anything else from anyone else? OK. I'll move away from the speaker before speaking. So can I ask everyone to stand up? Everyone. And then those of you who don't want to come on stage, please sit down. But very few of you have to sit down. Yes. Or don't everyone sit down, because then I'm going to make you all stand up until I get six people, for sure. Come, Mahesh. Sir? Just two more people, or do I need to make everyone stand up again? Oh, sorry. Please. 
Excellent. I think I think that will do. Unless uh, anyone else still wants to come up as well, we will equip, uh, we will need to get you mics. Okay. Just okay. Take them on. I'll have a look. Okay. Excellent. Uh, could we do a round of introductions before we start off, if that's okay? Yeah. Should we uh, get the, we, the microphones? We will. Uh, Alistair will just hand over the mics. What I'd like you to do, again, we want to make this a little bit more fun, if that's okay, with your permission. Yeah? So what we'd like you to do, all six of you, when you're introducing yourself, of course, talk about yourself, your organization, what you do, your role in your organization. Tell us three things about yourself. Two of them are true and one is false. And the audience needs to guess which one is false. Is that okay? We had someone else sitting there, right? It's a mystery, it's a mystery guest. It's a mystery yeah. guest. So while we get a, an extra volunteer, I, I, you know I've introduced myself, but I haven't done the three things. So I'll do three things. Um, Two, three, two lies and one that's true, correct? Uh, two truths, one Two false. truths, one lie. One lie. Um, I was once the lead singer in a band. Um, we were terrible. Um, I once played cricket for England. Um, and um, I have got three daughters. Played for England. Mm. That's the lie. You're correct. I nearly played for England against Germany, but I was the 12th man instead, unfortunately. So. Unfortunately, because you could have won. <laughs> <laughs> At something, yeah. Perfect. Next time, the audience can guess as well. Who'd like to go next? Please, your name, uh, which organization you're from, your role, and then three things about yourself. Two which are true, one is a lie. Uh, my name is Arshad Ali Sultan. I am from Alpago Properties, and I'm a senior procurement engineer. Uh, I'm like uh, leading the team, and as well as like uh, doing the things, whatever they're getting the request. Three things about yourself, two which are true, one is false. Uh, I'm like a quick learner as well as like I'm like in a good in cricket. And uh, I'm like uh, mostly like a, a shisha chain smoker and like uh, challenging. Okay. So which one do you think is true? Which one is false? I think he said three. Good in cricket, shisha chain smoker. Shisha. Shisha. Shisha, is that the one? Yeah. It's false. You smoke shisha <laughs> or you don't smoke shisha? I smoke shisha. <laughs> Understood. Sir. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Saurabh Mishra. I am the general manager for procurement and supply chain for Petronash. Uh, we are a uh, oil and gas uh, field equipment manufacturing company based in uh, UAE as well as in Saudi Arabia. I mean, so three, two truths and one false, okay? I meditate daily. I am a very bad cricket player. And I think cricket is a theme, right? So I'm just <laughs> sticking by it, right? And uh, the third is, I travel to USA once in every six months. Any guesses? Pardon? You, you don't meditate daily. I meditate daily. He meditates daily. He said he's bad at cricket, so he's probably good at cricket. Is he is also right. I've never been to US. <laughs> That's the only country I've never been. It's too long a flight for me to manage that. And where do you play in the UAE? Or do you have you stopped playing since you moved? No, basically we, we have a team of uh, my company. Excellent. So we keep on going matches here and there and we have another team. So See, it's like mercenary, right? Whichever team has a place open, you can go and play for them. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Uh, 
I'm Mahesh from Alphatim Group. I'm the procurement manager managing automotive category. Um, so uh, three things about me is I'm good in analytics. Um, I manage a team of 50 people. And uh, I don't like cricket. I'm, I'm definitely putting a ban on questions, <laughs> you know, comments about cricket. So no more. Second, second. Sorry, what is the second one? I manage a team of 50 people. Okay, how big is your team? Three people. <laughs> and I know one of them is here as well today, right? Excellent. No, no, no comments about cricket, please. <laughs> So that that takes away my talent for playing for international <laughs> team. <laughs> that, that goes out. Okay, hi guys. My name is Manoj Kumar Nair. I'm the head of supply chain compliance, vendor management, and inventory for a company called Shelf Drilling. It's an oil and gas uh, drilling company uh, based out of UAE with operations across the globe. Uh, okay, about myself, uh, I would say three things. Uh, one would be I I have done what you call I had numbered eyes numbered with them. I've done LASIK, that's one. Two would be I have been to Harvard. Three would be uh, I have played field hockey for the district. Now you're specifying it's not for the country. Make it yes. more believable. Just make it make it easier, right? <laughs> Any guesses? Any other guesses? Before he does the big reveal? Field hockey. Obvious it, one. It's, <laughs> it's procurement, you can't lie to them. <laughs> yeah. Wrong audience for this kind of game. It's on, yeah. Okay, that, that brings me to the table, right? The only woman here. I think we need one other here. <laughs> My name we is still Eric. have time for that if anyone Yes, wants. please. <laughs> we need some diversity in procurement, huh? isn't we it? We do. Well, I am a little bit different than all of you guys, though I spent 15 years in procurement and in automotive space in three different um, supply, uh, well, tier one suppliers. And currently, I am a founder of Extraordinary Leadership. And I was interested in your speech about people because what I do and I am passionate about, so that's the first thing. <laughs> is about helping leaders uh, to be more inspiring and to bring the people on board when they are leading the change. Uh, the second fact, um, I speak five languages. And the third fact, for you to evaluate, I have been a TV presenter. So which one is your false? <laughs> Thanks. Well spotted. So you have not been a TV presenter? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Super. Thank you for that. I thought we'll have a little bit of fun getting to know uh, each other. We will do that with each of you as well because you know the idea is that we meet each other once every quarter so we get to know each other a little bit more. So we know that we have people who you know, don't play cricket, people who play cricket, and people who are not TV presenters. Excellent. So over to you, John Joe. And yeah, thank you. So this is about a just general discussion around being a business orientated procurement function. And I think I'm going to start with questions actually, is just very simply, what does it mean to each of you to be a business orientated procurement function? What do you think the key attribute is of that? Uh, probably I'll take it first. I think from being a business orientated procurement function would be that you are agile and aligned to the business requirement of your stakeholders. Many a times uh, what does happen is that procurement function sometimes works in silos. And that does, and that's purely driven by the individual KPIs, systems, policies, procedures that we entangle ourselves into. And that does not allow us to sometimes see the, the eventual requirement of the business that is required and we end up creating kind of barriers, and people start getting a little frustrated with our responses, with our ability to, to deliver to, the, to their clients or the stakeholders in a timely, timely manner. So it's procurement's agenda, not the business agenda. It, it sounds like for them, it's like the procurement agenda, but the driver of that could be 
policies and procedures and audit requirements that we need to need to ensure that we are complying to. Okay. Okay. For me, I have a little bit different stance. So I think, especially working now or partnering with another CPO, and having done several change initiatives in a, in a business that I've been operating, I think procurement is a business partner. We are the catalyst of the organization of the change. And because we are working, as you said, with so many different stakeholders, and it's a shift from efficiency to evaluating, which is the first which needs to happen. Yeah. In order to do that, we need to think from the customers, from the end customers, from the business vision, from the business value, from the business purpose, right, and goals and objectives. So we need to actually think business and understand our stakeholders before we come with our buying process. Because yep. that helps us in our conversations mm -hmm. as well. And we need to bring them inside these conversations and co-create the direction. Obviously, we have our own ideas and an agenda, but it's not about forcing the agenda, it's about understanding yep. and aligning. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I feel stakeholder management is very important. I'll give you a real-time example which we follow in our company. So we set up a small group of four people called as acceleration team. So what we did is the job of the team is to just to meet the stakeholder and just to have a conversation about what is procurement, how we support your organization, what are the innovations which we brought in procurement. That's about just the team job is to do the stakeholder engagement. And then the second aspect is giving the empowerment to the stakeholder. Not everything is the procurement queue. If a project is completely complex and it is deep technical, rather than a procurement person handle it, it's business handling is much better. So that time we have to take an advisory role, whether the process which they handle is a pro I mean, it's, it's kind of policy related. So that's how we have, we as a team need to evolve. It's not like everything should be procurement scope. It should be business and procurement. We have to work in a silo, I mean, we, in a combined manner to bring efficiency and value to the company. So that's how we operate in Alpatha. Okay. Just to add, I mean, what he said about processes and systems and all. I mean, procurement cannot have a different agenda. If there, the agenda is difference between what procurement does and what the business, business does, this is a leadership issue. The agenda has to be same. And then it cuts across, cuts across how we do the stakeholders management. It's like we have to adapt our policies, procedures, system to meet the business. Process is because of the business. Business is not because of the process. So the earlier we are able to adapt it to the business changing requirement, because business is changing very fast. The market is changing very fast. The supply lanes are changing very fast. The geopolitical issues are changing very fast. We can't hide behind processes, oh, I need three quotations, which has to be completely vetted by all the people, and then only I can go, no. Leadership has to take a decision saying, if I have one single quote, if he's meeting my requirement, and I can do all the checks and balances with a one single quote only, and as a part of the policy, I can put together that everything is neat, we should be able to go forward. So that one thing is very, very important because compliance is also important, but we cannot hide behind compliance anymore. And the next thing is, it's time for us, the procurement professionals, to drive the business. We cannot remain a support function anymore. We should be a part of the competitive advantage that we give to our organizations. People should, many companies say that, okay, that company is good because its product is good. That company is amazing because their marketing is good. I mean, very few companies are known for their supply chain excellence, like Apple. Yes, they have a good product, but their supply chain is amazing. So the kind of industries where I come from, it's basically an equipment manufacturing where to make one skid, I have to buy around 155 engineered component every time. So what we did in our company is we, the procurement team went to the CEO and we said, gave them a plan. Saying that, okay, you tell us what are your challenges, what is the correct pricing that we need to put for our product, and then we kind of went to the suppliers, had a long-term agreement with most of those suppliers, and then we put reach that price point. Now we have the competitive advantage against our competitors. So we have to be at the driving seat and say that how do we build competitive advantage for our company? So, 
anything you'd like to add? So, so I think I say what, it, what, we, what I'm hearing here is it's about positioning, stakeholder engagement. Um, I guess the natural evolution of the procurement function, probably over the last 15 years, has created this moment. So if you sort of think, think that through, so if I listen to this, you've got common goals, okay? We're talking about you know, uh, understanding and aligning ourselves to the, your stakeholders' requirements, which are normally the business outcomes you're seeking to achieve. Um, better relationships. Um, understanding what your stakeholders' needs are. Listening, which I think is an often forgotten skill set. Here's a question then. Do you think that the skill set of the general, of your typical profile of a procurement professional has been engineered to be that person? Because I think we've had to evolve. And if you're going to be truly orientated to you know, uh, the business achievements, do we have, do we have the right you know, structure, people, character, profile? in place at the moment? Or is that going to be one of the key things that we need to work on in creating a business orientated procurement function? Can I take that? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's spot on. Yes, we do have a serious skill gap. In general procurement populations, it's not only I'm giving my opinion based on what kind of team I have, for most of the positions, even I interview regularly people. But the general skill gap that I understand is the vision of most of the procurement professionals is very myopic. They understand the PR, PO, negotiation, contract, how to, the complete PR to PO process. But their general understanding of business, general, under, general understanding of how a basic accounting system works. Let's not talk about finance, the basic, what is the debit, what is the credit, if you have a transaction, where does it goes and sits into the PL of an organization and how you build an impact. So that is one area, general business acumen is a problem and second is digital savviness. To be able to embrace digital environment is becoming too much of a intrinsic change resistance for most of the people. Mostly it's coming out of fear because they don't understand. I mean, most of the questions were there, all were about AI. What would AI do? How would AI do? And was it is going to change? So AI is going to change. It's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when. Today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, technology will ca catch up. Now, how are people able to work? Any AI is there, you need to be a trainer. Somebody has to train a uh, robot in your organization. So the people should learn the skills to be able to train a robot. That is the way you make yourself relevant in the future when it is going to come. Skill gap is a challenge. And what we have done in last one, one and a half years is we have forcibly asked a few of our people in the supply chain team to work at least three months in other departments. So we put somebody, okay, you work in accounts, understand how that system works. When a finance guy is saying that your invoice is not okay, why is he saying it's not okay? Sit with the auditors. So that is the rotational thing what we have done to kind of at least make them aware of the business acumen. Balance skill set, we have a structured uh, training program plan for them. Okay. Um, I, I have a slightly uh, different take on, on, on what was said. I think. Uh, supply chain or procurement as a profession itself is not very, very old. Purely if you see, when did you see the first supply chain or a procurement degree come to people? It's not been many years. It's not like accounting, finance, engineering, any of the other professions which have been there for years where people are graduating from schools and coming across. Probably in the last probably 25, 30 years, I did my post-graduation in materials management probably 24, 24, 25 years ago. That's when it started to become, and now you have got institutes wherein you are getting people trained in this profession into understanding what it requires. So it's just not, it's a mixture of actually an operation, almost an operation. I won't call it a support function because it's a critical part of keeping the operation safe, 
along with the sound knowledge of finance and accounting, what's going to happen, along with the risk appetite that you need. So it's kind of a very specialized function which has got, which was neglected and people were thrown into these roles. So if someone was not good in something, that would be the function. And even today in many of our companies, supply chain is not really leading to the reporting to the leadership. It is reporting to either the COO, C, C, probably a CFO in many cases, is not having the seat on the table. So that is, I think, the fundamental challenge which when you speak about the talent gap that is coming across, probably now you could come in, but most of the people who have come into the function have not come in by design. They, they have come in because they happen to be there. Or one of the options they had got when they had come in. So it is something that I think with, a new, with numerous uh, institutes coming up, you are seeing younger generations who are doing their uh, proper training and coming across and looking at the whole, I would say the whole supply chain, including procurement, uh, logistics, understanding the whole end-to-end -end gambit of it. But yes, the, even today for the people who are already in the functions, there is a gap and that gap is, is what is causing this, this issue about us not being able to get the right CVs and when you go out for uh, interviews, you'll find people who have done years of the same work, but when you ask some basic fundamental questions, you'll find the gap there. If I can add on this one. So I think first that procurement function is in transformation or evolution already since some time, because I agree it's the youngest function in the business. So obviously we have started somewhere to be the executioner of the purchase orders, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we aim to have a seat at the table and uh, ideally report to CEO function, which in some organizations is established already. I think to your point, a question, obviously we need to think first that there are different functions in procurement itself, right? So we need a little bit different skill set in operational procurement and strategic procurement. I've been in different parts of the business, so I can see that. But I think the main trend of change and the gap is about people skills. Because if we want, if we are by nature stakeholder management function or relationship builder. And I think that traditionally procurement has been, uh, focus in procurement is to um, develop knowledge, develop hard skills. Analytical skills are very important, right? Or negotiation skills are very important. However, if we want to drive change in organization, if we want to build relationship and position ourselves as an equal business partner as any other function, we need to become more people skills equipped, which includes how to manage our stakeholders, how to communicate with the impact, how to build emotional intelligence to understand how people uh, think, what are their needs, and above all, listening, <laughs> which is obviously completely opposite to convincing, which I think is a traditional way of buying process, which also needs to change. Um, so yeah, I think that all skills it is on a soft skill side of the business. So if I think this through, then I think there's a little bit, there's a conversation here that's about the skills of our people, and I'll leave that to Sam. But what I think there's underneath this is we're almost, in terms of being the business partner that that comment is making, we're a victim of our own success. Procurement has managed to push itself up the agenda from 25 years ago and say, we can do so much more. That'd be the first one. Second comment would be, at the same speed, we haven't matured the skills. Okay, so that would be the second comment. We've, there's a skills gap in both the capacity that the market has to, to say, we asked you to give us that problem to own and to solve, but actually, you know what? We just don't have enough people to do it. So a victim of our own success, a victim of our own demands. Evolution. And I think there's possibly one coming, which is, the next step of evolution is going to mean how do we design that role when technology is doing a vast bunch of the stuff that's there? Because if your procurement function becomes a bunch of bots, then that's not a business orientated procurement function in its purest, simplest procurement as a service. And I don't know what you think about that because I think there's a question here that is, will technology be designed that the procurement function is an output high levels of automated processes that we are contributing to. And I guess, how does that work? You know, what is, what is the next 
step for us? And how do we remain that real value-add insight function when technology is supposed to be eating our lunch, as the saying goes? It's a big question. Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's a valid, valid point uh, in the, fu in the future if you are looking at it. But I think there are some fundamental challenges, at least in the industry where I am working currently, is I, I discussed about the data asymmetry and where the data points are coming across. To even come to the point wherein an AI or a bot can take it up, you need some fundamentals that need to be corrected out. And any the companies I have worked, any company, I don't know what's the ratio here, here but at least 40 to 50 different systems and places of documentation where you keep it, everything is, is there today, right? And till that point in time when you come across, probably you will see dependencies there. But even if we do that, the way I think the system could work is some of the administrative tasks can be taken away from the buyer. For example, you know, after, if you have a very solid approved vendor list and you have defined places it can go, Maybe the bot can help in throwing the RFQ to the three suppliers you want to go to. After the codes come in, they can analyze, throw the, even release the PO if you're confident about how things are working across. So those kind of administrative tasks, definitely you can take away from the, from the buyer's bench. And you, if you want to make it a little more uh, controlled, you could look at putting a threshold to say X amount, X dollars and below, the system can run with it and above that, a manual interface just has a first cursory look to see if, it is, if it's going fine. So I think there is a role, but it will be, uh, I would say, nuanced, depending on the company where, they're, where they are and, the, and where their systems are. I, I, I'm looking currently in my organization for opportunities where we can remove some of the non-value added admin functions today our teams are doing and move them into more of a sourcing and more stakeholder management kind of roles that that could be more imp more uh, helpful to the organization. So automate those bits so that your procurement people can do the business partner piece. Absolutely, I think we can we can contribute a lot there. But when I speak to my teams, I see that they are spending 60, 70 percent of the times trying to justify doing admin functions, following up with the approver, saying guys, please approve it. The stakeholders are calling up. So there's a lot of time wastage that is happening that we could possibly sure. automate and make it more uh, more value add to the company or to the to our okay. stakeholders okay uh, clearly i can see the direction is procurement is moving from a support function to an advisory function that is for sure how we adopt ourselves for an advisory role is a question so to give you an instant alfitum is a very big company they are into multiple sector so we are kind of brainstorming a concept called as procurement 360. So in which we, our job is not just to procure thing. So procure is saving the money. How to bring the money into the system is also important. So for example, we have top suppliers where 100 millions of spend go to the supplier. Why don't we call the suppliers and ask them, why don't you purchase our cars? Why don't you uh, go to our, get an insurance from our Orient insurance? So how to bring the supplier as our client is our next step. So. That's how we, it's very important for a procurement function not to just think that you are just saving the money. You are also responsible in bringing the money because you are the person who's sitting at the seat of innovation. Mm -hmm. Whatever innovation happens, the supplier will first meet the procurement profession. Then, the go, then they go to business. So how you bring the money into the system and how you save the money for the company is very important. So that's, why, uh, that's what I think, uh, even though the technology comes, our advisory will still, still remain. To categorically throw some insight into what you asked that, how do we tackle the risk of technology to keep procurement relevant how do we in, in the future? Embrace the opportunity. Embrace the opportunity. <laughs> so I think what it's very important for us to first accept the fact is, the earlier we embrace technology, the better it is going to, better it will be for us. Now how technology is going to really help is to help with your tactical tasks. Say a, a procurement professional at a 35,000 feet, if you have to segregate what he does, a part of what he does is strategic in nature, 
other part of what it does is tactical in nature that means just doing business transactions so what we have done in our company is we are running through a digital transformation process slow but very cautiously planning for it is and we put together okay what are the business decisions you are taking or a workflow is coming to you just for the sake of you have to do it a simple example is say a production department wants a material a warehouse goes into the system issues the material and giving them thing why does warehouse need to do that transaction in the system is there any business case where production departments ask for a material and you you say no no there is none we automated it the moment when production department asks for a material it automatically issues in the system and a pickup slip is generated so you don't need to issue and then a pickup slip is generated so we are identifying these kind of items and eliminating the mundane task how to then how what happens is the person who is doing the issue tasks he has now more bandwidth to focus on strategic task planning collaborating with the people ensuring this inventory levels are optimally maintained ensure that there are no stock outs so we have to work along with the technology for us to add more value to the organizations like focusing on more strategic tasks this is the only way i look forward because we have to yeah. kind of embrace technology the earlier we do the more adapted our people will be to work along with it because technology is going to grow 100% yeah yeah i'll elaborate from my side <laughs> you're looking yeah coming from automotive space we already had for some time uh, a lot of those especially oems right and as well as big tier ones that i've worked with uh, 170,000 people worldwide um we had already started with that automatization a long time ago of processes which definitely fuels into efficiency right like the first keyword of procurement so definitely um the evolution of ai is uh helping us with an efficiency the way i see it and also with smartness you mentioned before about decision taking uh as well as taking the blood story right mm -hmm. so at the end it decision taking the part of decision taking is based on facts and data which obviously procurement organization aim to have through those kind of systems and at the same time we will never have 100% what we want at the time of decision <laughs> so there where it comes to human as well as i think that as you mentioned um free up the time for relationship building because at the end with our ai what is the missing element in all of that is connection and we build on trust build on connection our rela relationships in business and also spend time to understand our stakeholders stakeholders better so i think it's only an opportunity rather than obstacle i, I wholeheartedly agree i don't think the role, role of procurement being seen as a procure um, a business part partner function can happen without people and i think it's interesting because it makes me again if i sort of iterate this a we were evolving b we demanded more you know we want to be you know we're doing all this so recognize us please so then all of a sudden it becomes a snowball and you know we're being asked more and more and more and all of a sudden we've arrived at this moment where we don't have enough capacity we don't have enough great people um we haven't trained and necessarily developed the people to meet the role that all of a sudden we've successfully engineered for ourselves so i guess there's a question here is you could almost say that in when technology creates capacity it's going to save our ability to be the business partner that that we want to be you know it's 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 you know that challenge that we've got on doing all the things that are asked of us might well just be answered by technology enable us to keep being being the business partner. Absolutely. Yeah. And give us a space to develop leadership skills because also one thing if I may add I f I feel that there is a need for evolution from expert mind thinking to leadership mind thinking which because the technology will take a lot of expertise part already a lot of knowledge a lot of information so we cannot be attached to that. And so we need to shift the, in a mindset as well of who we are and this is very important part you mentioned in transformation is to create a new identity mm -hmm. of the procurement function of every individual that is in part of the journey that's the shift of the mindset needs to happen before we can actually talk about the skill set and engagement
I think there's an entire new section that we need to add to the next agenda, which is probably, you know, what are the new characters, profiles, and job descriptions three, four, five years from now of a, of a procurement team, you know? Um, I don't think analysts, and take this in its purest, simplest linguistic sense, analysts probably won't exist as we know it now. It will be a business insight individual. The system will drive the data, the old analyst becomes the business partner showing them what to do with data. And I think that's, that, is a, that is a true evolution to a business partner type mentality. But that, that, that would be a very, I think, I think that would be a very good topic, Varun, for the next one, Some, something around what are the job descriptions of the future procurement team? That could be a very interesting topic for us to cover. So I, I think, is that where we sort of wrap this session? Um, so thank you all very much, thank you. Does anybody have anything they want to throw at the panel? Any observations, challenges, disagreements, telling us we're all wrong? Of course we're all right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, panelists. Yes, you can leave the mic uh, on the stage. I hope that was useful for you. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, by doing this, by calling the audience on stage with us, we're bringing to you more practical experiences than we can do just by a talk, right? That's the idea here. Um, we will take a short break. There's tea, coffee outside. Uh, can we do 10 minutes and come back in 10 minutes? We do one more roundtable discussion. Think a little bit about whether you'd like to get on stage with us as well. Uh, the discussion is uh, a very interesting one, the talent challenge in procurement. Uh, we all face this challenge uh, in the UAE. We know that very well. Um, so quick break, 10 minutes, and we come back. Thank you so much, everyone, so far. So I think you know all, you all know this by now. Can everyone stand up? Just as you sat, right? So annoying. Perfect. Bring some energy to the room, right, I guess. Um, so the next topic, as you know, we're going to talk about the talent challenge and uh, which of you would like to, uh, everyone who wants to get back on stage, sit down. Nobody? Because then Sam will be really lonely there. I'm sure you have... Uh, you know, Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're going to talk about in this session and then perhaps, yeah? You'll have to get the mic, I guess. Yeah, so um, I think we've, we've touched quite a lot on, um, well, if I rewind over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been to quite a few conferences, as John Joe already talked about. So I work in the same organization as John Joe. I'm his uh, business development director. Um, and we spend a lot of time listening to procurement people from all across Europe, uh, last week in Saudi, now here today. Um, the biggest buzz buzzwords are all about technology. When John Joe did his, um, his presentation, almost all of the questions were about AI or technology. Um, but um, Gartner recently did a survey of 1,000 global CPOs. And the number one thing keeping them up at night is actually talent. So I think the main thing I wanted to talk about today was how do we attract, retain, and train our talent? And I think the other thing to th think about here is how do you actually create capacity within your team, right? How do you do more with less? And that was, that's the main topic. Brilliant. I see you convinced everyone because everyone is now sitting down, so everyone wants to come on stage. Okay, um, we can do this in two ways, of course. You know, you can come on stage, but if you're not comfortable, then we can have a roundtable discussion here as well. Uh, Zubair, I think it's always good when one person is, yeah? Thank yeah. you. You won't be, I'm sure. Thank you, Zoran. I think as long as we have uh, five people on stage, we're okay. Yes, sir? And this is great, right? When you go to a conference and they ask you, you know, would you like to be a panelist? Right? You know, you have so much to say and, you know, you're just listening. So this is your forum to also talk about some of these things, right? 
Natalia? If you'd like to, of course. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. You know the way we do introductions, of course. So that is something we have to start with, just your name, organization, uh, what's your role, um, and also three things about yourself, two which are true, one which is false, and the audience needs to guess. And this is an easy part, right? Audience, so do participate in this. Which one is true and which one is, well, which one is false, really, out of the three? Okay. Uh, and the mics are there. You do need to switch on the mics because then the people on the live stream can hear you. There's another mic there as well for you. Natalia, just hidden there. Okay, would you like to start, sir? Yeah, yeah good afternoon all. Myself, Tushar Trivedi. I'm working in a company called SafeLine Group as a director of supply chain management, as well as business development. Uh, I'm in UAE since last six years. I worked for all Indians, big conglomerates like SR, Jindal, Vedanta, Polycab, and all. Uh, and uh, maybe I am a good, dynamic, and aggressive person as a human being. And I'm religious as well as believing in the relationship. I am arranging all material in time. Which one do you think is false? As a procurement, nobody can give you material in time. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think that's me. Sorry. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't do that again. Uh, well, well, maybe I was too loud. <laughs> uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Zubair Safdar. I uh, lead the uh, procurement operations at uh, Solutions Plus, which is a wholly owned company of uh, Mubadla. We provide uh, shared services solutions. We provide other, uh, we, we, uh, we're starting to provide other uh, strategic solutions, advisory solutions. Uh, one of them is sustainable procurement, uh, which we are looking uh, at providing a service uh, as. And uh, yeah, so uh, if uh, I were to talk about three things, uh, I am a photographer. Uh, I The second one is I love hiking. And the third one is I am a bad father. Bad father. I did very easy as a way. Yeah. Like the last two, your challenge is to make it a little bit more adventurous, a little bit more interesting, and a little bit more difficult. Okay. So we can give you a few seconds if you'd like. You'll have to fool, feel good they've answered correctly. OK, let me try it, uh, making it a bit more difficult. OK, so first of all, my name is Zoran Katzman. I'm heading the UAE supply chain for EFS facility services here in Dubai. Uh, when it comes to the three stories, uh, first thing, I love watching cricket, even I don't know how to play it. Uh, second thing, my oldest son is 18, my youngest is four. And third thing, I got promoted only once in my whole career, which is almost 20 years. The third one is correct, the first one was a lie, yeah. I have no clue about cricket. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Natalia Wiedemeyer. Um, I'm uh, not in procurement. I'm in project management and change management. And uh, I only came on this stage because the topic is, the whole thing is about procurement, but the, the topic is, is about ta talent and uh, people development. So that's where my passion is. And I hope I can contribute to the conversation as well from, from maybe a little bit different perspective. 
um, and procurement and maybe in, in which perspective. Um, three things is, the my first ones? I have jumped with a parachute. I have accomplished an Ironman triathlon and I have hiked to Everest Base Camp. Second? Third one. I only hiked to Annapurna Base Camp so far. <laughs> And she ran the Ironman only three months back, I think. Yeah, I'm registered for next one next year. Wow, well, well done. Me, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam Mills. I'm Client Services Director for Kafka Procurement Solutions. Sanjay's already told you all about us, so I won't bore you with that. My three facts, or not facts. Um, last year I hiked to Machu Picchu um, when I was younger, I was a national champion in tennis in the UK. Um, and once upon a time, I danced in front of the Queen of England. <laughs> Any other takers? No. Uh, the tennis point is untrue. I did actually dance in front of the Queen of England, yeah. <laughs> There are no videos. It was a long time ago. Um, should I kick off? Okay, cool. So, yeah, I think, so I've already introduced the topic. Um, I think, thank you, John Joe, for uh, stealing lots of my thunder in your panel um, with lots of chat about talent. So I've had to re revise what I'm going to say a little bit. But um, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about was attracting talent. Um, so on that subject, I'm just going to quickly do a quick scan of the room. Um, how many people in this room first intended to go into a career in procurement? If you did, put your hand up. Really? Not a single person? One. How did, did you intend to have a career in procurement? Okay, two people in the whole room. Um, and I think that says, that says quite a lot, right? Um, we've already touched on it quite a bit in the previous panel, but um, there's not enough grassroots development, um, you know, marketing and advertising of procurement as a strategic function, as a career path for, for talent. So my first question to the panel um, is, what, what are you doing to attract talent into your organization? Well, <laughs> it is indeed a big challenge, uh, you know, because, uh, see, there are multiple reasons uh, why people don't get attracted to procurement. One of the reasons that uh, we all discussed, uh, John Joe also mentioned, is that uh, uh, you do not have that uh, visibility, uh, procurement does not have that uh, visibility and the, uh, the importance in the organization. Sorry, so, sorry to say that, but that's a fact which we all acknowledge. And so once the attractiveness of procurement increases, probably peop more people will look at it as a career. And, uh, uh, and, and see, there, there is a sort of another thing that I see is that procurement has that uh, sort of glass ceiling. You know, I, I don't know how many of you agree, but... Uh, um, uh, you, you don't see a lot of procurement professionals uh, rising to the top CEO levels and the C-suite levels. You know, I think that is one of the uh, 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 one of the things. And the other, uh, the third thing would be, uh, you know, that uh, there has not been a lot of awareness, and people have not been taking uh, procurement as a can conscious career choice. You know which could take them through their career of maybe 30, 40 years. Uh, you know, they, they are always uh, getting into procurement and materials management, supply chain management, as a result of something, you know. Yeah. So here's an interesting one then. So when you're, when you're sat around the dinner table with people who, who don't know what procurement means, how do you describe your job to people who are not from procurement? Genuine question. 
I tell them I spend the company's money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this okay. usually brings them to laugh, but uh, it is very difficult to describe it without presenting yourself as a simple buyer. Yeah. And uh, most of the people that come into procurement as a profession come from an administrative position where they get an additional responsibility of procuring things and then eventually they grow. And, and what I see, especially here in the UAE, is a huge gap between these beginners and procurement professionals. Nobody really takes care of them. Yeah. Um, of uh, people who are in between this. So you have a lot of people who remain executives for their whole career because th nobody ever told them that there is uh, something beyond what they are doing uh, in their current position. Once they bridge this gap and, and come e either into organizations that have great teams or, or figure it out by themselves, then they start learning, then they start developing very fast, and then you have the, the real procurement professionals that are building a, a career in procurement. Questions because I'm please, genuinely please interested. Please, <laughs> please. please. Um, no, the question would be where is it more difficult to hire people, both real procurement professionals or the junior, rather at present when AI is still on its way to take over administrative jobs, or those junior admin. Um, uh, people, which which is more difficult to to find the talent for, for the senior people or for the junior people who would do a lot of admin. I think uh, like organization when we are approaching to find out the challenge for procurement, so better we should get the people from our inside. Like like suppose my, I can give my example. Like I was mechanical engineer only, and I was taking care of projects and maintenance and like all this thing. So then after I did my MBA and I, I was being given chance from my management to where to go and then after like my HRS put me in the procurement. So like I was very much technical. So if my re re like uh, requisitioner is coming to me and is asking something, I am understanding all the process. I understand he should not ask anything like unnecessary pressurize. He, he should not be like uh, fail in the plant. So like I am technic techno commercial. So, so I can better get the material in time with good price and I can be good negotiator because the supplier cannot be cheat me because I am the expert of that product even. So for the organization, we have to develop uh, this thing, uh, talents inside the company and we have to promote them in purchase or procurement so that he can be getting more delivery in terms of pricing, costing and uh, better material in time. So I think that is Maybe if you allow me to add, uh, what, what I have seen is, uh, uh, I mean, from my experience, is that uh, uh, you know, you know, when you work with people, when you partner with uh, your uh, end users, your uh, you know, different units within the uh, function, and do you do real value addition, you know, and you make a difference, that is when people really get interested. I've had so many people, uh, you know, reach out to me. Uh, saying that, yeah, I want to come into procurement. Uh, you, do you have an opening, uh, you know? And, and I have seen a lot of people getting interested in procurement, you know, from that aspect. Uh. Yeah. I think um, the reason I asked the question is... Somebody is saying that procurement is like a uh, like very green field, like something like very nice. We are getting something like out of, out, out of services or something like that way. But when you are entering into procurement, you understand that you are... Jack of all, you have to, you have a lot of hell inside the procurement. So there is nothing like very greeny grass like what you told like that. So. Back to the perception of the game, right? So um, we, we had lunch last week. Sorry, I'm sorry. Shall I hold it here? <laughs> it comes back to the perception of procurement. So when we hosted this um, round table in Barcelona, it was, it was about talent. And um, we had a really interesting conversation about how do you make procurement sound more sexy? And as you said, right, you can do some really cool stuff in procurement. Right? As, as a consultancy, we get involved in all kinds of things, and you know, some of the stuff we do, you, know, you could actually say it's, it saves lives. Right? We're working in healthcare procurement. 
we're helping um, defense with building runways and all this kind of stuff. But do you think that we market procurement as a cool, interesting profession enough to attract people? No, I think that is uh, gravely missing. You know that that that, uh, that creation of uh, perception that procurement is uh, is indeed a very good profession. Uh, you know, you know, wor worthy of uh, building your career uh, for for a whole uh, you know for a whole career life. So that that is severely lacking, and and we do not have the tools to uh, you, you know convince people. I mean, how do you uh, go to a talent pool and uh, you know? you know talk to people and convert them to uh, you know procurement passionate professionals how do how do you do that uh, you you know again uh, the uh, uh, the thing that came up was that uh, you know we uh, when we go look out for people you know we are uh, 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 aggressively growing organization you know and at procurement also we have uh, we had a very lean team now we have exp you know we have been expanding uh, quite a lot uh, and and we do have the challenge of uh, um, uh, getting people getting the CVs, you know. So you you uh, look out for CVs. You get very few CVs, and you, you get you know there have been times for very interesting positions. You get uh, just a couple of CVs, and when you actually interview those uh, candidates, you don't see that uh, attitude towards procurement, uh, and and you don't see the right attitude. People may may know the buzzwords, and you know they would do some reading they would know what is a purchase order and so on but i mean i i personally when i recruit uh, i look for um, i look for attitude i look for the right uh, you know mindset because you know the, the the procurement skills are such that you know you can train anybody uh, you know on those skills there there are a lot of uh, a big chunk is transactional skills but you know to get the right mindset is challenging yeah, it comes back to what was said in the last panel, right, is you need to really define what you want the future procurement person to look like. And I think one of the bi biggest things you need to think about is the soft skills, right? Is the person a problem solver? Can they talk to all these different areas of the business? And then, yeah, you can train some of these, you know, some of the more hard technical procurement skills. Um, I'm just going to move on to retention um, because... And it, I'm not sure about here, but in the UK, this is um, something that, that is um, a massive struggle for a lot of organizations, including our own, but also um, all of our clients. Um, it's, it really is um, a buoyant job market. Um, people are moving. You know, loyalty is not what it used to be. Um, so you're having to do more and more to try and retain your staff. So I'm interested in, t in um, any examples of successes or things that you guys are doing to... Um, to retain s your procurement staff because retaining talent is just as important as attracting it, right? Well, I, I can tell you one thing. Uh, having pool tables and games in the middle of the working day doesn't work for retention, especially not in the UAE because... Not in procurement. Not in procurement and, and not in the UAE. Uh, at the end of the day, nobody of us here, we are all experts, I believe, nobody came here for the sun. We came because of the money. So here it's uh, even worse. It's uh, even more related to the package. And I don't know that the, the people can uh, disagree with me. I think about 10% of the decision whether to move uh, sits with the, with the company brand. So the really big companies, the Amazons, the Microsofts, will attract people due to their name, due to their brand. The rest of us, we, we do have a big fight to fight. If I may add, this brand is, is a very, very good point that you're making here. And uh, if we were talking about people skills and soft skills, something like growth mindset is, is key not only to retention of ta talent, but also to brand building. It's not set in stone that there are brands that are inherently uncool, and that's why you cannot attract people. And people who are already there, if they 
understand how to, even procurement, I'm not from procurement, and I've seen here in this country ecosystems and companies and places where they have pool tables and they have their kick uh, tables and they have their puzzle corners where people have just to, you know, like to, to shut down and go do puzzle 10 minutes and come back with fresh ideas back to their workplace. Uh, it is possible. And uh, growth mindset, even in the brand, you can make your brand a cool brand. Attract people, so that's one thing, to, to, to make a cool brand. You know, we are sitting here with a very cool brand, I think. And this brand is also new and has, hit, has right, the brand that has invited us here today, Consolidon. And I think it's a really cool brand that has built itself to be a cool brand just recently and has done an amazing job, right? So being part of something cool is obviously helps people or encourages people to stay. But there are like so many other aspects on how to retain people, how to develop people. I also work as an organizational team coach. So there's this, these ways how you build relationships, you know, like some of the things how you can retain, you build mentor mentee relationships. If you have the gap between, you know, like junior staff, you have a lot of junior staff, they took over you left. And then you're looking for some professionals who have done it already for 10, 20 years in procurement. And you all are saying that procurement is a very young profession and it sells. So to find people who have been doing something that has only emerged 10, 15 years ago, that was doing for 20 years, it's very difficult. But if you, if you put the effort within the organization or within your teams, you know, like with a young talent that you have acquired to develop it through years, I think that that would increase the, the chances that, I mean, I don't really want to, s to say about loyalty if the package does not match, right? But if the package matches and you have good, stable, um, uh, pleasant organizational culture, then the, the possibility to retain talent is uh, increasing. I think, uh, sorry if I can. Uh, I think uh, retention, uh, as you know, that's your question. So, <clears throat> as I said, uh, you know, uh, the first thing is to uh, attract and hire the best talent. Now, that is a double-edged sword. You know, so if you if you attract and re uh, recruit and um, hire the best of talent that is available in the pool, then you know you you uh, it's a bigger challenge to retain them because you know they are they are the cream of the pool and they would obviously uh, uh, you know, you know if they are of that mindset you know they would also be uh, you know uh, tending to get easily frustrated and get out of sync with what's happening and they want to change and they would have opportunities so uh, I, I think uh, what I, I have uh, myself done or pr probably uh, seen is that, you know, uh, you, 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 you uh, involve the, the people, you know, you, you balance their work. Uh, you know, pro procurement is largely a transactional operation, but you do have transformational activities. You do have strategic, uh, you know, uh, things that you do. So um, uh, what I... Uh, uh, like to do is that uh, I, I sort of like to, uh, you know, appreciate them whenever it is due, you know, and I would uh, also like to uh, uh, carve a small component out of their time and get them involved into uh, more of a strategic, uh, uh, strategic initiatives, uh, transformational initiatives, so that they uh, secure some buy-in, uh, you know, within the unit. And then they also uh, get some visibility to show their, uh, you know, uh, other than the transactional skills. So uh, uh, this is this is something which has, uh, to some extent, worked for me. And I, I think that keeps the interest going, it keeps the excitement going um, within the individual. And this is something that could work. Yeah, and I think um, just acquiring the best talent is, is not always the best approach, right? So growing your own, training your own is is it could, there's a lot to be said for that because you build you know these, this person has then the same company cultures and that kind of thing so i guess question to you guys is is what are you doing in terms of training for your procurement folk have you got any good kind of lessons learned or any good stories that you can tell to the audience 
generally in our team we are like promoting the people to go for like sip staining or something like capp or capm and all this thing and in india also like we were sending to iims and all like i am also i am pass out so that type of tra uh, trainings motivate the people to go for something more output and uh, they will get motivation and that will be charm of the life otherwise the procurement is like routine purchasing is not a good thing so i think training is required for this i think training training i think training is really really important um, but after people come back from the training or after people have you know accomplished the training that was offered by the organization so important is to give them opportunities to put the training into practice you know like if you train people in ai but all you do is excel spreadsheets after they have learned AI, they are actually more likely to leave than before they have learned AI. So um, that that should be um, integrated into into the way you work. You know, like encouraging people when they come back, encouraging them to share their learnings, and through I don't know individual goal setting or um, other kinds of you know like all those uh, mentoring, developing people, asking them, how can you implement? What, what did you get from this training that can, we can improve within our team, within our organization? Uh, can I? Uh, so one, one thing uh, that I have uh, uh, sort of experimented with and done is that, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at different places uh, where I work, so I've always uh, encouraged uh, team, my teams, or even rather uh, times, you know, uh, uh, you know, steered them towards doing certifications rather than attending, uh, you know, one day training, two days training, because those trainings, with due regards and respects, you know, they are very good, excellent trainings. But then you come back and you don't have anything to show for it, you know. And but when you uh, when you encourage your team and when you actually uh, uh, you know, budget uh, certifications, paying for their certifications, you know, that, uh, uh, get, that, that makes them study themselves, makes them uh, pass exams and achieve certifications. So that actually, uh, 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 you, you know, sort of is it's a sense of achievement. Uh, you have achieved something. Also, that uh, sort of gets them more and more invested into procurement. Like they have uh, gathered uh, five uh, certifications in procurement. So, you know, that, that um, uh, gets them more invested and less likely to uh, veer towards a different career. Can I share an example? I used to work in a bank as a project manager. And within this project manager, like we had a large organization of project managers, large PMO organization. And what they did, they offered us in-house trainings. And through this in-house training, we were gaining the knowledge of PMI organization, but those trainings did not qualify us for certification. So what our organization was making sure is that, that they have very high quality professionals, well-trained, but they're their, their qualification is worth a lot more in-house than on the market. So in this way, they made sure that we come back and we contribute and we don't collect five certificates and go and shop around the market. It's an interesting, it's an interesting approach. <laughs> um, one of the things you said, Natalia, was quite interesting around training somebody in something and then they're not getting a chance to use it. Um, and uh, I'm going to use this to segue into the next part of the discussion, which is around um, how you can make, you know, get more out of the, the, re the resource you have. Um, so we've talked quite a lot about using AI and technology to eliminate or r reduce repeatable, repeatable tasks. Um, I'm going to ask the panel, um, are there any activities in your procurement function now that you and your teams are doing that you wish didn't have to exist because the people in your teams just don't like doing them because they're boring they want to be doing the more interesting things so what what is currently happening in your functions now that you wish you could eliminate pretty much half of their working day <laughs> uh, 
Mm. Take the we, word. This, yeah, <laughs> we, we are, a, we are a, a huge organization and we have a lot of projects and clients and, and therefore we have a big quantity of small value orders. So our average day is about 125, 130 LTOs, which need to be converted, which need to be approved, which need to be sent to the vendor, all the follow-ups and everything. And this is the thing that uh, we are looking to change in the next six months. Then the, the second thing that everyone, whoever worked in, in construction and facilities management knows is the contracts, which are again another very boring part where everything is agreed, now someone needs to sit down, type it, but as JJ men mentioned, this will soon be history hopefully. We are going to, to buy a software that will, using uh, templates that are pre-approved by legal, basically create the contract in five clicks or less. So these are the part, no, no, nobody likes to, I mean nobody, almost nobody likes to do repetitive work each and every day. And we do have other things that are much more interesting. Any examples from your organization? <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, the approvals. There are a lot of approvals in, uh, in uh, as uh, somebody said, uh, you know, you, 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 you just navigating all through all those approvals is very frustrating because that is where uh, the, uh, the sort of end user, uh, you, you know, gets frustrated because you've, you've done all the uh, hard work and now, you know, things are going through approvals and, you know, you just go you know, follow up with all uh, each approval. Can you please approve it? Can you please approve it? That's uh, that's sort of uh, in a, in a way frustrating as well as I I would say uh, sometimes that's humiliating also. You know, because you're 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 genuinely asking for uh, something which is the responsibility of that person, and you know it, it looks like you know they are doing you a favor. So I think this is something uh, which. Uh, uh, you know, we in our organization also, uh, we have done a lot on this, but we need to, uh, you know, uh, work more, simplify uh, uh, the approval cycle. Uh, you know, there, there, there should not be any duplicate, uh, you know, bounce back approvals and so on. We spend, a we spend a lot of time helping organizations to transform, right? Uh, so you know, creating capacity without adding more people um, because it makes people's jobs more interesting, it creates eff efficiency, it means that procurement is, is adding more value, but it, it, it's really interesting because everybody knows that it has to happen, but what's, what's stopping you from, what are the barriers that are stopping you from making those changes that you, that you know have to happen? Yeah, I, I can give you an example, like uh, I was in Vedanta and we were having 65,000 items. So for 65,000 items, we were 27 buyers, purchasers, okay. So to cop up this huge purchase procurement uh, gamut, what we did, we consolidated all the requirements and we make annual rate contracts. And one time, like we were having a approval matrix up to nine level. So my buyer is everywhere going like, please approve, please approve and it goes up to CEO level and all. So we make con contracts and then after we put all this thing into a shared service center. So once it is done, so shared service center, like people are only placing order, simple. So the like all the all pending requisitions, uh, PRs are cleared and like uh, we were happy to go to the office at six o'clock. Otherwise we were doing work up to nine o'clock in the night. So the type, that type of leveraging with our employees and uh, that motivate our team, and we come out with the achievements. I, I think I think what keeps people from or organizations from change is exactly this manual work. Oh my God, we are so uh, tied in our you know like we are so uh, uh, busy sewing the, the the wood that we forget to sharpen our souls, right? Um, that's why we, we are so tied up in our daily processes that we just cannot think beyond that next approval. And actually, it's, it's quite easy because it kills like many, you know, like birds with the same shot. If you find a person who would be, even from your junior stuff, who would be interested in doing some project work, you know, like if you give that person resources, a little bit free space, 
uh, you help that person to brainstorm small solutions on, on some case, you know, um, you will start improving your processes from within, within. You will start building your capacity, developing your people, and helping those people that you have to grow. And once they have created something within your organization that they can be proud of, that also invest them. So that creates that loyalty, you know, like that they stay to also reap the kind of like the, the, the fruit of their hard work there. So I think it's, um, um, uh, Zoran was saying that, okay, it's like we have to do a large solution. We have to go now from zero to 100. Sometimes it does happen that companies completely revamp. Those are really also very hard transformational change projects that many of them fall into the 70% category that did not succeed, right? But if you start tackling smaller projects, you know, in an agile way, giving people results quicker, helping them to do their job, you know, like having more um, interesting jobs um, that improves the entire thing, you know, like simultaneously kind of. I think one more thing uh, that we do is, uh, you know, we regularly present to the uh, C-level leadership, uh, you know, our numbers and uh, what we have, what transformational activities we have done. So we, we get, uh, uh, you know, some of our team members to, you know, each present one of the slides. So that uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, removes that fear from them because, you know, a lot of people have fear. Maybe we all have fear. <laughs> Simple as that. So uh, by doing that, uh, actually, uh, it removes uh, fear. It, it 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 and it gives them visibility, uh, you know, to the uh, senior leadership, and 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 that gives them a chance to uh, you know just talk about talk in front of people. So that that, that actually works uh, in a bit way. Yeah, I think I think Sorry, bringing that's people. all we have time for. So you oh. can. Okay. Just close out, closing remarks, I guess. Okay. No, I, th I think that's a really good point. And, and the same, you know, bringing people on that journey and in involvement is killing so many birds with, with the same stone. Um, I'm just going to finish off with an, another quick room survey. How many people in the room think that their procurement function doesn't have enough capacity to deal with the demands of your organization, the growing demands? Hands up if you think you don't have enough capacity. Wow. Everybody... Everybody's good. Everybody. Everybody's good. <laughs> right. I think um, like well, I think I think we've gonna have to wrap up. So just gonna say thank you, thank you everybody for your input. It's been really interesting, and um, look forward to talking to you a little bit more at the networking break. Thank you so much, Sam, and thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. And now I'll welcome Diego, who's our next speaker. Uh, He'll talk about leveraging wellness to create a high performance culture. There you go. Here? Mm, all right. It's fine? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. All right. Let's see if I can adjust this properly. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's better. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. I hope you're having a great day. We are going to discuss today how to leverage wellness to create a high-performance culture in our organizations. So let's get started. And I always like to start with this story about my friend Victor, really nice guy. Um, he doesn't know that this is happening, by the way. So. Victor is um, someone I met in 2015, right? And we all remember Victor because he was A, always late, and second, always sweating. Well, you can imagine the kind of jokes that we used to have around uh, Victor in the Dubai summer, right? Well, he had a very particular routine. He used to wake up in the morning very early, 6 a.m., and the first thing that he always did was to scroll on his phone, emails, WhatsApp, social media. Sounds familiar? Well, the second thing he did is rush into the shower, take the kids to school, straight into work. He would get to work at 9 a.m. Sometimes he would be late, as you can imagine. 
and work all the way until midday, right? If he had time, he would eat. Otherwise, straight uh, until 7 p.m., he was back-to-back -back meetings. Life is hectic, he used to say. Now, it was not always like this, right? When Victor got to Dubai, he was 10 years younger. He was an athlete at university, and he was quite a healthy guy, right? Um, but life just happened, got busy with work, family, and now he doesn't like the man in the mirror, right? He doesn't like how he feels, and uh, he doesn't feel productive, he's always tired, he's always blaming the circumstances, he's reactive. My question to you guys is, how can someone like Victor become an asset and not a liability for an organization, right? How many victors do you know that are underperforming, that are always tired? Well, fortunately, there's good news for Victor, which I will be sharing in some minutes. Now, who I am and why uh, you should care or what do I have to bring to the table? My name is Diego Carrete. I am the Chief Wellness Officer at First Abu Dhabi Bank. And although I have been in the wellness industry for over two decades, my background is in business. I've studied in different universities around the globe. And I merged my passion for wellness with my expertise or my academic background. I have founded different uh, organizations in the wellness industry. And uh, I'm going to share something with you. To me, uh, vulnerability is a superpower, right? It's what allows us to essentially connect with each other. And I'm going to share something with you very, very personal. So in, I think it was 2018, I went with my wife to an endocrinologist in Sarja, and looking me in the eyes, he said, my friend, you're gonna have a hard time if you want to ever have kids. And the reason he said that is because I've been through an eating disorder and my hormones were not where they were supposed to be. But the good news is that, as you can see, now I am a father of one, there is another one on the way, and I fix this with lifestyle interventions. Which means that there is a big reason why I'm so passionate about wellness. Now, enough about myself. Let's discuss what are we actually going to be covering today and what are the outcomes. So learn, uh, we're going to learn how to uh, leverage wellness to build a high-performance culture. Then we are going to understand the rise of wellness in leading organizations worldwide to differentiate between poor and good practices, basically the do's and don'ts, and we're going to learn a framework so you can today basically implement wellness in a sustainable way within your organization. All right, so let's dive in. Before we start, a couple of questions. How many of you have implemented any sort of wellness in your organizations in terms of initiatives or contracted a third party? How many of you, please raise your hand. Four, five, six, seven, okay, less than half. And um, how do you uh, consider wellness in terms of how important do you think it is towards business outcomes? Who thinks it's a strategic decision or a strategic move from an employer, right? Could we agree that it could be somewhat important to have wellness as a, as a pivot to acquire good outcomes? Well, we're going to discuss these questions in the Q&A. This is just to safeguard myself in case no one asks questions, at least I force you to respond. Anyway, let's dive into the why. Why do we need a wellness department? Uh, we're gonna start with the why, like Simon Sinek would say, and there are three reasons why I believe, and literature agrees with that, we need a wellness department. The first one, we need a strong employee value proposition. The second one, we need to increase productivity. And the third one, we need, we want ROI, right? So let's uh, tackle some literature that um, discusses the um, employee value proposition. Why do we need to enhance that side of things? Well, as you can see here in this study by PwC, salary alone is not the only argument. It's not the only motivation. Motivations nowadays go beyond remuneration. So. There is 20, uh, in terms of, well, this basically is explaining us how one, 
in five employees are ready to leave. They're literally ready to walk out the door. And you can see the segregation by age and see how Gen Z workers, which are the future talent, uh, the youth, uh, basically the ones who are going to conduct business moving forward, are ready to leave. And it's something to be concerned about, right? Next uh, figure is going to show us the reasons why employees are ready to leave their jobs. I'm not going to read that. You can have a look very briefly. You have the top factors driving attrition on the horizontal axis and the top factors driving retention on the vertical axis. And the ones that are highlighted in red, guess what? They have at least something to do with wellness. By all means, I'm not saying that wellness is the only answer, but I do believe, and we do believe at FAB, that is a strong aspect of our brand and employee value proposition. Okay, now, in terms of productivity, how does wellness help productivity? It's going to help us to improve our energy levels. I do believe that, as well as vulnerability, energy is also a superpower is the ultimate currency. I don't know of any successful individuals who are or who have below average energy levels. Enhanced mental clarity and focus, right? This is going to allow us to be responsive instead of reactive. Because when emotions go up, intelligence goes down. Reduce stress, that speaks for itself. Fewer sick days and being pain free. 40% of the absenteeism nowadays is responsible, or sorry, is uh, caused by MSDs. MSDs are musculoskeletal disorders, so neck pain from commuting from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, or from sitting on a chair, or from living in Sarja and being stuck in traffic for an hour. Well, you might have back pain or cervical pain. Well, 40% of the absenteeism in your company is caused by that, and there's a fix. Enhanced creativity, rarely nowadays we see Men and women working from a place of creativity as opposed to a place of overwhelm. And that makes a huge difference. Last but not least, improved confidence. If there's something in common um, when it comes to the greatest decision makers of all times is their confidence and their strong self-image, their strong self-confidence, right? There is a great book by Dr. Max Maxwell Maltz that is called Psycho-Cybernetics probably the biggest piece of uh, literature that talks about self-image. So I do recommend that you um, have a look at that and talks about the importance of confidence and self-image towards making decisions. Now, discussing ROI very briefly, there's two types of uh, costs when it comes to resignation and attrition. The first one is the apparent cost, the one that we see. Normally the ratio is one to three or one to five, meaning for one dollar, that we can feel that is hidden three to five dollars, right? Cost of basically overburdening our colleagues or extra workload for our colleagues when we're trying to recruit someone new, et cetera. And that basically makes up for the hidden cost. So it's not only what we see on paper, it's what happens at the workplace. And again, literature shows that is three to five times what we can actually see. So that makes it for the ROI. Now let's talk about how. We have discussed the why, employee value proposition, that's number one. Second one, productivity, and third one, return on investment. Now let's discuss the how. How are we actually going to bring this to life? Well, that's the first thing that I would like to suggest anyone who wants to implement wellness in their organizations to avoid, and is the firework syndrome. And I was just outside talking to someone I, I, I knew, I knew a couple of people here, great to see you. Um, they were implementing or they had implemented a couple of uh, wellness initiatives. And that was a clear reflection of the firework syndrome. I asked them, how were the results? Did you guys notice any sustainable change? And they said, no. This is because giving apples on a Thursday morning is not going to make anyone healthier, right? And uh, giving a free therapy or massage on, you know, whenever, is not going to make them healthier either. There has to be that congruency, right? We need to have a strategic lever internally that is able to drive those initiatives. Now let's discuss a little bit further. This is an interesting topic. 
there's three steps that I have built and put together for you guys in order to build a functional wellness department. The first one is to find a strategy. As I just said, spending the money doesn't justify the investment, right? And that's the first thing that we need to understand. The second one, we need to align it. So how do we align wellness, the wellness strategy, with the business strategy? They need to go hand in hand, right? Because employees' performance is key for business performance. And the third one, we need to identify the positioning. Where do we want wellness to sit in our organization? And I always utilize this. Wellness is not urgent, it's important. It's somewhat like your pension, right? Compared to your salary. Your salary, you need to pay DIWA, mortgage, whatever. It's more urgent. You need to pay your bills. But yet, when you retire, you may want to make sure that you have your investments in place. And that's wellness, right? It's having this infinite approach to business and to health. Um, which is, again, another great book, The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. How do we do that? Let's dig a little bit further. Bring the experts on board. I cannot do this alone. I've been in wellness all my life. I cannot do this alone. That's why at FAB we have hired different specialists. One of them is our ergonomist, Olivier Girard from Geneva. He uh, has been conducting a campaign over the past six months. Well, on the first uh, campaign, on the first day of the campaign, we gathered almost 1,000 people live. In the UE, we are 6,000, right? That's what, 16% of the, 15, 16% of the organization were watching, which means that they need something, they want something, they want a solution, right? And that's, that I will discuss in a second. And the second one, dare to ask. We do it with the people because it's for them. It's not because I say so or our organization says so. We basically, do what's best for them. We conduct different surveys at an N1 and 2 level and organization wide to understand what are the different demographics, psychographics, and wellnographics in this case. What, are their, what is their wellness at? Now let's dive into, uh, okay, good news for Victor. I almost forgot. There's good news for him. They hired a chief wellness officer in, in his organization, so now he is no longer on medication. He has more energy to play with his kids after work. Before, he used to get home, you know, crash on the couch, completely destroyed. Now he has energy for his kids. He leads by example because he knows that behaviors are caught. They are not taught. And he has more time for his family and he feels better than two decades ago. And that is a real case scenario. Now, what are we specifically doing at FAB? We have five, uh, a five-pillar framework that we've built from scratch that contains the five pillars of wellness, according to us. The first one is nutrition, second one, lifestyle, third one, mental health, fourth one, ergonomics, and fifth one, exercise. Absolutely everything that we do at FAB, every initiative will fall under at least one of these pillars. Next one, please. Uh, we have the dual method. What do I mean by this? These initiatives have two components, and this is important. What happens if, essentially, you tell your daughter, your son, who here has a daughter or a son? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, your name is? Yours. John Joe. Okay. What's the name of your son or daughter? Isabel. Isabel? Okay, awesome. So, two things. What happens if you are just munching or having some Oreos or cookies in the couch and you tell her not to do the same. It's, yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. And secondly, you're not leading by example, right? And the second one is if you tell her to eat healthy and then she goes in the kitchen cabinet and there is nothing healthy and there is only cookies and, and junk food, you're not enabling her, right, to follow your advice or your example. Well, that's what happens in some organizations. They teach you something they tell you, do this or do that, yet the environment is not essentially congruent with that. That's why in our strategy, under the five pillars, there's two components. There's the behavior that we are teaching, and then there's the environment that we are habilitating, so we give our employees the power to act, right? So if we are telling you that you should build muscle because you're going to live longer, and you, we want to help your metabolism, and help you have a healthy body composition, we actually have a wellness space in the main branches, right? And we are going to build one wellness space in each branch. 
if we are teaching you ergonomics, we are bringing the ergonomics to the UE and we are adjusting the workspace based on the audit that he's doing. So we teach a behavior and we acclimate the environment to give the employees the power to act. Last one, and this one is really, really interesting, um, even though it doesn't look like, because there is a graph missing, and it's a shame because it was, it is beautiful. There's no uh, graph in there? Hmm, okay. How are we gonna do that? Hmm. So basically, let's all do a small exercise of imagination here. No, let's not do it, it's too complicated of a graph. Um, we can stream uh, Google, perhaps. It's actually interesting, I'm sorry guys to, you can just copy that, Roger and Moore technology, technology adoption model, and it's actually very important that we understand. I hope there's internet. Do you have access to internet? Yeah, yeah just Google. And just paste that. Adoption model. Yeah. Images. Technology adoption model. There we go. That one. Uh, in the middle. The colorful one. Down in the middle. That one is. Okay. There we go. You can see more or less. Okay, who here has an iPhone? Raise your hand. iPhone's here. Well, you probably know somebody who slept or have seen someone sleeping outside the Apple store, right? Because they wanna get the latest iPhone, which is pretty much the same as the previous one. I have an iPhone, by the way. Well, those are the innovators. This is basically the explanation of an adoption cycle in the technological industry, right? So we have basically taken this model and made it a wellness model because we realize that there's a lot of uh, commonalities amongst both models or amongst both crowds, right? So the innovators are the ones who are ready, right? The wellness fitness enthusiasts. So those are the ones that we want to basically tackle and appeal to first. We will not waste our time with the skeptics because that's a waste of resources. They might be ready one day. Now you see that there is a gap in between basically the early market and the mainstream market. That is approximately 16% of the organization. So this is important. When you reach 16% of a crowd, this becomes a bigger snowball effect where you can you know, release the brakes and you will get momentum, right? So it's very important to reach that 16%. So we are focusing on the innovators and early adopters. And a great example of this is the thousand people that tuned in for the ergonomics first that we basically reached that in the, in the first campaign, which is great, right? How many of them are going to stay consistent? It's very important if you are implementing wellness in your organization that you focus on those who are ready, right? And you don't waste your time on people who are at this point in time not interested because wellness is a cycle. Sometimes you have so much going on at life, you cannot force people to eat healthy and do push-ups and this and that, no. Because sometimes you're just not ready. You need to respect that. But the markets work in a, in a very peculiar way, right? The visionaries are going to take the example of the innovators and the pragmatists are going to take example of the visionaries, right? We like to take feedback from previous groups. So when in an organization you see people um, showing up to the classes and talking about it, also FOMO kicks in, right? Fear of missing out. So that's why we have adopted this model. We are focusing over the first two years to reach that 16%, so essentially, we can get everyone on board. And uh, how long does a wellness intervention take in terms of incorporating wellness into an organization? Well, it depends on the size, obviously. But for us, we estimated that four to five years would be a conservatively reasonable amount of time to actually implement wellness. Because if an internal transformation of our department sometimes takes two to three years, imagine bringing something completely new, completely external, and try to essentially uh, make it permanent. And this is pretty much it. I do apologize for this uh, technical glitch in the end. Um, I'm ready for questions if you have uh, some. Thank you. <laughs> I'm
I'm not sure if this is good or bad. Either I was super clear and you guys are ready to implement wellness in your organization or I've done a terrible job. Oh, I was hopeful. I mean, very interesting and very appealing also. So how does it work? Say, for example, we roll out a program that, yes, we want to go into wellness, and we get the 16% of the people to listen to you, right? They come and talk to you. Now, how do we monitor, basically? Say, for example, we are doing a class on, say, mental well-being, a basic, simple thing like a meditation or being more emotionally aware or something like that. So do we track their progress over a year or o over the period have regular interventions with them and All right. so publish the rec uh, whatever our findings so that we other people also look at them and then start getting interested in it? Your question is how to track this, how to track progress, how to justify an investment in wellness. First, do we need to do that? Yeah, for and sure. And if we need to do that, how do we do that? Because many people might not be even ready to share. Say, uh, I'm doing meditation. How many do you have? Uh, say, for a thousand people, right? Say, I have a small organization, maybe 70 people in staff. If I look at the critical 16% mass, would be around uh, 10, 10 odd guys. Yeah. Right? But say, you said thousand people. So, for a thousand people, how do we track that? Yes, if they are doing mindfulness, are they regularly really doing it and how they are doing it? And how do we track the outcomes? I would use an analogy. Uh, when you implement wellness in your organization, you sense that something needs to be done, right? So you have a direction. Um, these initiatives, these um, surveys that you should run internally at different levels, right? Because the way that wellness impacts the guys at the top is very different to you know, people who are maybe just starting, are more junior. So what you want to use these surveys is basically to refine that direction and compass. And remember that Surveys can be anonymous, speaking about mental health, speaking about nutrition, speaking about you know, your insecurities, whatever that may be, can be anonymous. So it's always good to track, basically, not only the engagement, but actually level of satisfaction. And there's two things here, something important. Wellness is different than well-being, right? I would say that well-being is an outcome, and I cannot be responsible of your well-being, because if I help you lose weight, I help you sleep better, but you have something bad going on at home, you're not going to have any well-being. That doesn't mean that I'm responsible, but I am responsible as a wellness officer to actually give you the tools and resources that you need to implement, right? So you need to track wellness. How do you track that? Participation, engagement, satisfaction, and you have to do that at different levels. At the end of the day, it's a long game, right? Remember the infinite game. One more question. Sure. So you had basically five teams which FAB is targeting. So is there a sequence which we should ideally use or we should attack all five together? Again, this, this is a good question actually, so thank you for that. These five pillars are based on our understanding and my experience in the industry, right? I see big giants worldwide implementing wellness and they have physical and mental health. Great. For, to me, there has to be that, a further segregation needs to be done. Ergonomics, one. Nutrition, Mental health, exercise, lifestyle. Lifestyle includes sleep management, stress uh, optimization, right? So the order in which you implement this has to be done according to what you think is needed in your organization. You run an audit, you run a survey, you see that compass in which direction you're headed and you prioritize accordingly. I started ergonomics because I understood that there was a need in terms of solving. There's a lot of people from Dubai to going to Abu Dhabi, commuting, people work long hours, imagine traders, whatever that may be, it's specific to your industry. So I thought, maybe I'm wrong, I hopefully I'm not, that ergonomics was the first thing that needed, what is the low hang, lowest hanging fruit, right? And I thought that uh, indeed ergonomics was the one. Order depends, depends on you, right? You can even run them simultaneously, if that makes sense. Thanks, thanks. More questions? Question. Yes. No, actually, say, I want to talk to you afterwards, so that's, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think I very much liked because 
part of what I do is mental health uh, coaching. So it's mental fitness. I wanted to ask if you know positive intelligence for mental, mental uh, fitness from positive intelligence. But I wanted just to share. So all my questions I will leave after. But to your point and to the points of others, I think what I want to share is that that is a very, very important topic for any organization, any team, and any leader. Because I totally agree with you that when we don't focus on this, we cannot be productive. Our stress levels are very high. We cannot manage or lead, I should say, lead our teams effectively or procurement organizations effectively. And that's a driver of performance. So if you have not implemented yet any mental health or any wellness, because I totally resonate with many, many different pillars. I am attached to one as a, as a, from the expertise point of view. But uh, that, that is really going to affect the performance of your organization. So to your question, I think I can only imagine how difficult it is because I have not led any of those transformations within my organizations in my past life. But uh, I think that uh, that takes for sure a lot of efforts into branding and into uh, benefits sharing. And uh, you did an absolute great job into linking it with, with finance because I think that's very important, the ROI, yeah. uh, highlighting to the, to the decision makers of the sponsors, right? So uh, whenever you can attach the mental health or any wellness initiative to uh, business ROIs, right, return of investment, and this always goes into performance, it always goes into um, focus and decision making and stress levels. Currently, stress level in majority of organizations is about 59%. 59% of people in the organization are stressed. Yeah, and that's an average, <laughs> exactly. And if we are stressed, we are just working from our survival brain, and we cannot be optimal. So, just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yeah, nice presentation. And like, I am your follower since long, and we are in touch. Uh, as a director of my company, I would like to uh, present to my company for your wellness program, okay? So I have two questions. Like my management will ask me, what is tangible benefit? Like what is ROI in terms of tangible? I don't, we will not believe in resignation and recruitment and all, but we would like to get some tangible benefits. And second thing, like we are in UAE, everybody is uh, believing in two years only. Like after visa renewal, nobody knows whether the, my employee will be there, or it run away, it will be continue or not. So at that type of situation, what do you suggest? How can we go, go ahead? Well, I think uh, part of that uh, turnover, or like if you don't have a tool that can attract and retain talent, then you're gonna have a high level of turn turnover, right? You have sometimes high levels of attrition. So if you create an attractive culture with an e attractive employee value proposition, that fear will dissipate throughout the years because people would want to stay. I have examples of people that attended my lessons on the first year that I started with Fab that said, listen, the community is what kept me, you know, I was thinking of, you know, going to another country and whatnot. And wellness was one main reason for that person to stay. So in response to your question, it's not a matter of what do they believe, it's a matter of then opening their eyes to what studies are saying big studies, and also where the UAE is headed, right? You see wellness everywhere now, there's the same sustainability, and so it's just a bit sometimes, you know, getting out of you know, our own way. I've seen a lot over the years, and just, just having a little bit you know, of uh, understanding holistically, right? So I would say if they go into the data, they will see how it's totally worth it. To what extent you wanna get invested? probably, or most of the times, they are investing in ad hoc initiatives that spend more money with less results. Wellness is not that expensive, right? But not having wellness becomes very expensive, and that's what I've learned. Thank you. You're welcome. So we'll go to Amr first, and then Anuradha, and then come back to you if that's okay. Hi. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for the topic, and great initiative by FAB. So I, I want to ask particularly about some organization who might not have a wellness, um, you know, a chief wellness officer or this in their agenda. So what could an individual do? Now, there, a lot of this is, on, is there on the internet that you need to meditate, exercise and all, but sometimes procrastination 
takes lead and then you working uh, we're talking about procurement and people spoke that they work till 9 p.m so where's the time left to you know take care of wellness so what are two or three things that you would recommend for people like us where in some organizations you might not have it but you're really passionate so what is it that an individual can do to tackle this and take care of wellness so you're talking about uh, from an individual perspective individual perspective well I believe that there's a lot of information out there and you need to know who you listen to. So find someone credible uh, to follow. And if you have the uh, ability to, I have mentors in my business side of things. And I believe that that helps me, right? For instance, I, I had in wellness, I had my mentors in the past. So if you can go that route, get someone who can guide you. Um, and if you don't, just make sure that you find credible sources of information because that's probably the most difficult part to actually filter out who's legit, who's not, who's you know a marketing uh, scam and who isn't. To be honest, nowadays is. And for your organization, I would start by identifying champions. So if you don't have the ability, the interest, the appetite, just identify champions, people who are really passionate about that. You will find many people in your organization who are passionate about yoga. Probably they have certifications on the side. And then you just can encourage them and give them certain benefits so they can start acting as champions amongst their departments. And then you will see the real appetite that people have. But give a voice to people because that's one of the things that I found that for myself uh, helped me the most. Give a voice to each and every one. And they, er, you have a talent hub or something in your organization, something where you, they can share their skills or do you have something? Yeah, yeah, we do. Then you just create a post who is interested in wellness or that there's a lot of enthusiasts and use them as champions to basically lead others. Uh, a lot of people, including myself, we like to do things for others without expecting anything in return. I'm sure your organization is full of them. Thank you. Well, that's a great start. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I totally loved your presentation, but the cynic in me says, you know, one meditation class or a yoga class or a pantry full of healthy choices is not going to help me deal with an inherently stressful job or a bad job or a toxic work culture. So I feel organizations have to first do these basic things right before you or before or probably embark on a wellness journey or you know, talk about other nice things to have. But the skepticism aside, I wanted to ask you what kind of KPIs are you have you been tracking? Because it looks like you're well into your uh, you know, wellness journey with FAB. Are you looking at percentage of insurance claims being reduced or number of sick days being taken reduced or attrition level? What, what are the key KPIs that you're that, looking that's at? That's more of three, three year three to five. For now, what we started, I started with, with KPIs in terms of engagement. So I said during year one, if we are 6,000 people, I want to actively engage 20% of my organization across the world, right? So that's what we are managing and we are, we are above that. And then for the next year, we are about to set the KPIs for 2024, but high level, some of the KPIs were 20% of the organization to be engaged in the wellness initiative, initiatives. Then we had the surveys and we did one at the beginning of the year and one on two survey, then we did bank-wide um, survey and we are going to basically compare. Um, they're very tactical. Some of, the, of, of these surveys are linked to benchmarks by the World Health Organization. So there, there are some solid um, standards that we, we, we follow in some of the questions and we just, uh, it's also learning as we go, right? Because we are sort of trailblazers in this matter. And uh, although I have experience, we need to also adjust to the market and see, uh, play it by ear. Be sort of rigid with the vision, but flexible with the approach in a way. I'm not sure if that was clear. I hope it was, but yeah. We have time for one last question. So if Zubair, you can just ask your question and then we'll wrap up today. Uh, looking at your five pillars, I, I know it, it, it could be challenging to monitor them because, you know, they're, uh, at the end of the day, they are all linked to the person, individual. It, it's very personal. You cannot uh, ask a person, what did you eat uh, today? Uh, my question specifically is that uh, what do you do about uh, sleep management? How do you monitor? Because, see, that, that's a big problem in this uh, region. You know, you have uh, emails coming at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you know, it's 24 by 7 people are online. So how do you uh, uh, 
make people aware or how do you monitor if people are uh, you know having good sleep management uh, that's a good question and it's a big challenge one of the things that we are doing after ergonomics my next uh, challenge is i have hired contacted a sleeping coach so i'm going to bring that person on board and we are developing the tools to monitor and support sleep with an ecosystem that works outside of the organization. I also have to say that in order to tackle certain things, you need to keep that congruence. So you cannot preach internally that you should go to bed at nine and no more business after nine, then you have line managers sending emails at a certain time, right? So you need to balance those two. So wellness needs to come top down, right? And we have leaders and visionaries in our organization that really walk the talk. And that's why we can make this happen, right? So get everyone on board from top down, and that's something that needs to happen culturally as well. That, does this help? But you have no way to uh, you know, statistically uh, monitor that. You in, know. The, in the future, we will, mm. because there is devices and everything. Yeah, there are devices. Uh, and essentially, you can, how many, it's as simple as survey. How many hours do you sleep on an average? 5.5 hours and whatnot. And three years later, then, the average has increased to 6.5 hours. There is, we can talk for hours on this matter, but there is many ways in which you can track uh, this sort of performance numbers. Thank you. You're welcome. Super. Thank you so much, Diego, and thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being patient with us, with listening. And this is the first time we're doing an event for the procurement community. And we are glad that you were able to attend with us. I'll leave you with some quick next steps. Um, so one, uh, we talked about a few objectives of this community. The first objective, if you remember, was knowledge from others, right? So I'm really grateful, of course, for John Joe and the Capita team, Sam and Anthony. And of course, I'm very grateful to Diego for coming down here today and sharing with us their knowledge. But if you'd like to nominate other speakers or nominate yourself as speakers, please do reach out to us because that could be very useful for everyone in this audience. Second, um, knowledge by sharing. Uh, if you come across any thought leadership that is uh, relevant to other procurement leaders, please do send it to us. I'm not sure, uh, some of you of course are part of our procurement ecosystem already, so we have a partnership with HBR, and uh, some of the things you talked about, they sent me articles for HR, they sent me articles for marketing and sales, they haven't sent me any articles yet for procurement. So if you have any thought leadership that you have access to, send it to us so we can circulate it through the rest of the community. Okay. I'm sure HPR will come up with some great articles for you as well. Um, third is build your personal brand. Today was a great example of how some of you took the opportunity to build your personal brand. Of course, we'll reach out to you and uh, ask you if it's okay if we can post some of this on social media, et cetera. Um, but uh, thanks for taking the time out, everyone who did that. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Maybe you can just stand up so everyone can give you a quick round of applause, if that's okay. Whoever was on stage with us today. Natalia. Thank you so much. It was um, really great. I'm sure besides for your organizations, it was really great for your personal brand. And that's one of the benefits of joining a community like this. Um, opportunities. Um, we do post opportunities in our procurement ecosystem right now. So far we've posted maybe seven, eight opportunities in the last two months for procurement professionals. These will benefit you. These could benefit some of your friends. So if you see any of your friends who would be um, interested in any of these opportunities, please do uh, ask them to apply for the opportunities we post on the ecosystem group. Um, if you have any roles, opportunities which you believe uh, you need support from the ecosystem to source, please do send them our way. Uh, and we will post them on the, on the group. And last, hopefully you took advantage of some of the networking opportunities today. Uh, please do help us increase the size of this community. This is your community, it is for you. So please do invite your colleagues, friends in procurement, your team members. 
the only criteria to join really is you should have 10 plus years of procurement experience then you join and become a member of the community. And once you're a member of the community, you can bring three of your team members to these events as well, okay? Um, there's a link to uh, join this community. And it says there, see you next quarter, because that's what I asked the team to put on there. But I hope to see you next week and the week after next on this WhatsApp community, this WhatsApp group that we've created. Uh, we hope to make this a very vibrant community, and I'm sure we can do that with your support. Thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and support today. And please join us outside. Hopefully, there's still some tea and coffee. And uh, let's stay for a few minutes. Let's get to know each other a bit more. And then let's head back home and have a good weekend. Thank well, not a weekend. This is supposed to be on. Oh, I should tell you. Uh, these meetings are all meant for Friday, so these will happen on Friday afternoons, like 3 to 6 p.m. That's what our HR community prefers, that's what our marketing and sales community prefers, and I'm sure it would be a little bit more convenient for you as well, uh, but we will get your feedback if another day is more convenient, right? And that's why I'm in the habit of saying have a good weekend, but have a good week ahead. Bye-bye.